perhaps hoping for some support. Lori, I'm not sure about how many hyena there are in this clan. I'm not sure if this hyena belongs to the Talek clan, which is apparently over a hundred hyena. But generally speaking, they won't all hang out together. So they'll move from place to place and they'll gather at the den sites, but you won't really see them gathering in large numbers, except occasionally to challenge another predator for their kill, or as I said, where there are babies around, because the den site is the social hub of a hyena clan. Big yawn showing its massive teeth. The hyena's bite force is that much stronger than the cheetah's. Here he goes, lurking around. <laughs> Not going to challenge the cheetah again. These boys have already shown him off. Now what you'll see as these cheetah begin to feed is just how fast they're going to consume their meal. So they are going to try and feed on as much as they possibly can, as quickly as they can. They have absolutely no idea when their next meal is going to be and they don't know when they are going to lose this one or if they're going to lose this one. They've worked hard for it, now they need to replenish their energy levels. Now you can send through your questions as well, and you can do that in the comments section below. Because this is live, it means that we can actually answer them. Uh, we will hear other vehicles starting up in the background. As I said, there are tourists who are coming to experience this amazing thing. Tourists are great. Tourists bring money, and to the money ultimately goes to protecting these fantastic cats. And the cheetah numbers within the Mara are probably some of the most stable in Africa. Here we go, tucking in bloody faces. Luckily, the wildebeest is now dead. Its suffering is over. And it's a really hearty meal for these five boys. Now, where they're going to end up is anybody's guess. They are dominant in this area around, for those of you who are familiar with the Mara, around the Rungkai Valley, the Rungkai River, and Talek region. And in turn, they've got to keep their territory safe and protected. And of course, they will be siring the next generation of little cheetah cubs as well. Aaron, no, Talek is not in the Mara Triangle. Talek's actually a village outside of the Mara National Reserve, and it's about as far, it's, it's quite far east. It's right on the eastern boundary of the Mara National Reserve. There is a river called Talek that runs through Talek and then meets up with the Mara River. Um, the Mara River forms the boundary before, between the Triangle and the Mara National Reserve. So no, at the moment we are in the National Reserve. And this particular wildebeest is probably part of the loiter herd rather than the one of the massive number of wildebeest the wildebeest back into Tanzania. Uh, I do apologize. Apparently there was a little bit of a breakup in terms of our signal. As you can imagine, the highs and lows of the area that we're in, as well as the dramatic weather, are playing havoc. But it's quite extraordinary that technology exists, that I'm able to sit here in our car and show you this happening right now. It really is quite extraordinary when you think about it. I still find it extraordinary, and I do this every day. So what you'll find when the cheetahs start their feeding process, and I know that it is a little bit gory for some of you, but it's quite fascinating in a way. They don't have massively strong jaws. And what they'll do, although most predators will do this as well, is they will tuck into the softer parts. A wildebeest skin is very tough, and they'll actually pull away at the skin around the armpit and the groin and the belly. And for them, the most prized parts of the kill are going to be the internal organs, not the stomach contents, but that's what that cheetah is after over there. So it's after the kidney, the liver, the heart, the lungs. That's what they're trying to get to. Richly, you want to know about the white sack that is now hidden behind the cheetah's head. You want to know what that is. That's the stomach contents. So obviously, as a ruminant, a wildebeest has a four-chambered stomach, um, as well, of course, as the intestines. So that particular sack sits just like, you know, most mammals. It's at the organs, um, the main organs, the kidneys, the spleen, all of those are hidden behind 
the stomach contents and the stomach contents sits the closest to to the abdominal wall so that's what they've pulled out over there now what you'll find is if this if they do manage to keep this kill they'll probably pull that out and they'll abandon it on the side and the reason for that is essentially that entire sack is filled with grass that is being partially or was being partially digested by this poor wildebeest so that's really of no use to them at all and it is also very very smelly which means it could attract attention what is that over there is that a lion it's a lion it's a lion there is a lion here here comes a lioness now there's a very good chance that I knew I heard lions in this vicinity now there is a very good chance that these cheetah are going to lose their kill she hasn't sp has she spotted them yet she's actually moving along the ridge of the road I don't think there's any way that she's going to miss them all right now at any moment this lioness is going to launch herself towards them Boyd, no. One lioness is sufficient. Where one hyena was not, one lioness is. And, and that is particularly because if she sees them, she's actually moving. She hasn't seen them. She's moving with intent towards some vultures that are behind me. I think she thinks that that's the kill that she heard. So she's come here because of the sound of the wildebeest, but she hasn't exactly figured out where it is yet. So she thinks it's the vultures. Um, but in fact, it is the cheetah's kill that are a little bit further away. The vultures were just resting there to try and dry after the storm. So she's going to investigate that, but I think any moment now she's going to see these cheetah. And the cheetah's body language is instantly tense because a lioness will be able to kill one of these cheetah. And even with all five of them standing up against her, she will still win. So it only takes one lioness. She's over double their weight. There's no way that they are going to be able to fight her off. And in fact, the most sensible approach for them would be to run away. That's quite interesting. She heard the general direction that this kill was in. How oh, extraordinary. Nope, she's seen them. Now she's seen them. She's facing. Oh, no, she hasn't. She's facing the right direction. Yep, you can see the change in the angle. Now she's seen them. And these, these cheetah are probably going to be gone. In fact, they're already moving off. There they go. Cheetah are going. The cheetah are running off. Their kill is gone. And the lioness is coming in. Oh, the, these cheetah are going to keep running. They're going to duck between the vehicles that are up in front of them. There they go, dashing off. And here comes our lioness. She's going to, even the hyena is running. And there we go. We have the answer to whether or not they would challenge her. She's not going to bother to try and chase them, I don't think. She's got an empty belly. She's hungry too. Martin, no, I think she saw it. So we have a question coming through from Martin. I think she saw those cheetah rather than she smelt the blood. And I could be mistaken about that, but I think the wind is blowing her in slightly the wrong direction. It might be that the smell caused her to look around. And there we go. The cheetah's hard work, now you understand why they ate so quickly, why they gorged themselves as quickly as they did. All of that hard work is now done, and the kill belongs to this lioness. Now, because this kill is here, she probably won't chase the cheetah. She'll probably let them move off and go on their way. And unfortunately for them, they're going to have to keep searching. And that is that. There's no way that the high... Oh, here come the other two lionesses. Here we go. So she was slightly ahead of the group. These are the lions that I heard roaring earlier. There they come. I didn't know where they were, but I did know that I'd heard them, and I knew the general area that they were in. So it just goes to show, we tend to, or not we, people in general tend to revile hyenas as scavengers and praise the big cats for being hunters. But it's all about survival of the fittest out here. And lions will scavenge when they can. They will chase smaller predators away when they can. It's just one of those things. Just as those five cheetah males would try and steal a kill from a smaller predator. It's very much a circle out here. Really massive, strong lionesses compared to those cheetah. 
Callum, no, I'm afraid to say I have no idea which pride this is. I can tell you that I am in the Hummercorp region of the of the, the Mara National Reserve. Um, I'm close to the Runkai Valley, and they're moving towards a place called Balloon Crossing, or at least that's where the cheetahs have disappeared off to. But as to which lions these are, I'm afraid to say I don't know. I'm pretty sure I will have seen them before because I've explored this area quite a bit, but I don't know which pride they belong to. And if any of you out there who do know which pride this belongs, these lionesses belong to, please do get hold of us. We would love to know, and it helps to expand our knowledge of this area as well. It's only recently that we've properly been able to explore this corner of the Masai Mara. Now let's just wait until these lionesses come in. There's not all that much wildebeest to go around and whilst it would have been plenty for the cheetah you might find that there's a little bit of growling and fighting between the lionesses as they establish themselves at the kill one lioness is already well and truly tucking into her hard well i was gonna say hard one meal she didn't really work that hard for it did she Jenny, you want to know if the if the cheetah managed to eat much of the kill, which is, of course, what we're all wondering. Not really, unfortunately. They didn't even manage to remove the stomach contents. You can see they've chewed around the shoulder, around the armpit region, um, and they have managed to eat quite a bit of the back end. But it, it's, it's a good meal for a cheetah, but it's not sufficient. So that is why cheetah hunt as often as they do. They're actually very successful hunters when you compare them to a lion or a leopard. Oh, that was weird. I was expecting her to go straight in, but she just did a little... Almost like she changed her mind. She's got a much fuller belly than the, than the first lioness. So no, the cheetah will hunt again. As I said, they're more successful than the other big cats in terms of their hunting success, but they lose the highest percentage of their kills to other predators. Cheetah really are <laughs> the bottom of the food chain. Oh, lioness. Endearing herself to all of us. Perhaps she felt as though she needed to salvage their reputation. You can see the lioness on the right growling. lots of affection between the lionesses because of course lionesses and a pride are all related to each other it's a sisterhood of mothers daughters aunts nieces they grow up together and they grow old together and just like that the drama has played itself out we've gone from sleeping cheetahs in the rain to hunting cheetahs to scavenging lioness all in the space of less than half an hour quite an extraordinary aspect of um, the Maasai Mara. Uh, this will bring to end the end of our action broadcast and what an action broadcast it has been. Please stay tuned because the Maasai Mara has a plenty to offer and we haven't shown you nearly the tiniest percentage of it. So from myself and Ferg and the vast variety of animals that we see out here, we bid you farewell for now but stay tuned for more action. very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Sunset Safari. <laughs> that was quite an extraordinary start. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Fergus is on camera with me and you can get hold of us in the usual way which is to tweet us on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. You can send through your questions and comments. Um, perhaps you would like to share your thoughts on what just transpired in front of us. We're going to send you over to Taylor for now because she was got, I mean we've had an action packed afternoon here but it sounds like there's even more action across the Angama football pitch. Hello, hello, hello. You just joined us right in time for today's Super Sport match. Here we go. We've got Reds against the Blues. It's a bit wet out here today, but luckily this team is well trained on the wet turf. My name is Taylor and I'm going to be your commentator for this afternoon. And we've got David bringing you this uh, action-packed sports game. Right, back to the action. Who's on here? Roll! Oh, we got a goal! Team, the Red and Gama Devils score again. Woo, woo, woo!
Look at that. Absolutely so excited. Now, tweet who you think should be man of the match. Hashtag Safari. No, no. <laughs> I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Sunglasses on my head and everything because that's what commentators do. Hello again, everybody. I'm not a commentator. I'm... Guides and chefs. Oh, sorry, I believe the gremlins are attacking during the sports game, so even they seem to be here too. Now we can say that they live in South Africa, in the Maasai Mara National Reserve, the triangle, and also on the football pitch. So sorry about that, everybody. Okay, we're going to not watch the sports game anymore, but anyways, basically, uh, Angama and a couple of other lodges from the western section of the triangle have all got together and uh, come and have a bit of fun and play together, which is quite nice. It's a sort of common thing around the lodges whether you're playing touch rugby or soccer a spot of cricket you know whatever floats your boat but we're not uh, the only girls out here today <laughs> although Tristan's not a girl <laughs> let's go back across to Tristan while I desperately try and compose myself lodges playing soccer and most of the lodges out here actually do have soccer teams and I'm, I myself have partaked in some of those games. But a very warm welcome to Juma Game Reserve into South Africa. It is a wonderful afternoon, actually. We've got a bit of cloud cover, so it's not too hot, not like yesterday, and everything seems quite promising for this afternoon. Now, as Taylor mentioned, my name is Tristan, and on camera today, I've got VM, the Wildebeest, and it is live and interactive, which means hashtag Safari Live or YouTube chat, should you want to get hold of us. Now, the plan is for this afternoon, VM and I have been discussing this at length this afternoon, is that we feel that there's something strange in the air. So we both think that there might be a something uncommon, rare, or something unusual lurking about. We've su surmised that it could be Mvula, it could be Shongile, it could be any something like that. So we're doing all different parts of Juma today. We've decided we're going to drive all the places that we haven't been driving, that we've been neglecting. So now we're on the new road right up on the western boundary. We're going to go up towards Sydney's Dam, and we're going to check all along the Bufuzuk boundary, and then we're going to come down towards the Mulawati and check Twin Dams much later in case Hassan is there. And if nothing, then we're going to head off to the Birmingham's at Chitwa and see what they're up to. So that's the plans for this afternoon. Hopefully it will be a good afternoon. Hopefully we'll find something epic. And, well, if we don't, it still will be fun anyway because at least we're not being absolutely scolded by some bright sunshine. There is a little cloud layer and everything is quite pleasant. It's definitely a change in the weather as well because there's a bit of a breeze blowing, little wispy clouds, and it just feels as though rain is coming at some point. So I wouldn't be surprised tomorrow morning we wake up with a little pitter-patter of rain on the roof. I think so. So anyway, what do you think, Vildi? Yes, Vildi also agrees, he hopes so as well. We were just talking about how it's still quite dry for this time of the year. And we're hoping that a little bit more rain will come through, even though it will make things thicker, we do need it. Now, while I contemplate puddles and rain and all kinds of other things, I believe that Rebecca is telling me that Jamie has puddles on her side. And I wonder, did they have a rainstorm today? Do we have a rainstorm? Do we have one singular rainstorm? We got hit by about five, I would say. So a good five rainstorms are oh, sweet. This is a lovely scene. So I've left the lionesses for now, and I've just come to, I think I'm gonna stop here, just because I think, let's, let's do this. There we go. So we've got puddles everywhere. We can stop here. Puddles everywhere, but the sun is finally coming out. I would say it's probably rained, mm, how much would you say for a good 20 mils while we've been sitting around with these boys? And I wish you could have seen them. I was I was sort of hoping it was going to continue until we went live this afternoon. As it was, um, our plans changed considerably. But I was hoping you, you'd get a chance to see them because it was too sweet. They were all cuddled up in the rain. Now, of course, we've got some affection with an ulterior motive here. Let me clean your face because I love you, but also because you're covered in blood. Which, of course, is very tasty for a cheetah. Sorry, boys, but at least you have slightly fuller bellies than you did before. It's an unfortunate reality of their lives that they're going to lose most of the stuff that they kill. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful with the flowers and the sun and the cheetah? What a lovely scene. So after what was quite a gory start, 
Solo, you want to know what flowers these are? Um, for the life of me, for some reason, all of a sudden now, all I can remember is the is the toilet paper flower, which is ridiculous because I actually learned their Latin name about three days ago, but my memory's decided it's decided to turn into a sieve. Solo, hold that thought. I, it will come back to me, and I will remember, and I know that Judy H will be able to tell you in a split second, but let me see if I can try and get my brain to remember what it is. They're all over the Mara at the moment. And I know their name. I just, you know, my brain's a little bit frazzled as well from the direction that our afternoon safari went in because it, it, it changed course quite dramatically from us cuddled, sort of tucked up in our jackets underneath the, the car tent to filming the cheetah hunt in the space of a few seconds. At least you made the right call rolling up the side, Ferg. That was a, yeah, that was, that was a good idea. Because we'd rolled it up and put it down about five times this afternoon. Sorry, boys. A reluctant look over their shoulders and off they go. Elana, yes, they can. I mean, one one hyena they could protect the, the kill from, absolutely, these five boys, which we saw. And in fact, even two or three hyena might be a bit intimidated by the prospect of five cheetah males. And in fact, I would say that a leopard would think twice about tangling with these five boys as well. You know, a male leopard mm, would be an interesting battle, and I think that the cheetah would probably relinquish their kill before trying to fight for it. But a female leopard, I don't think, would decide to challenge them. So yes, there are predators that they would be able to keep their kill safe from. It is unfortunate, though, that three lionesses, there was not a chance. Even when that first lioness came in, we knew without a doubt that they were going to, they absolutely were going to move away from her as quickly as possible. Now, there are some wildebeest in the background. Sorry, I just had to cover up my monitor because there's <laughs> still water dripping. <laughs> I sprayed, I mean, we started that whole hunt. I sprayed so much water back here. I got a face full of it. Now they have eaten, but there are wildebeest at the back. I don't think they're going to try again though. Not so close to those lioness because the lioness will just hear it and they'll come back again. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and catch up. They've now got quite far ahead of us. And we'll make our way onto the next ridge. And just to warn Bex, who is in the director's chair this, this afternoon, just to warn you, I'm not sure about that dip. I think we should be okay. But I'm not 100% sure in terms of signal. Oh, there's another car behind me. One day I'm going to reverse into someone. Slippy sidey. Okay, I'm going to slip and slide my way to get ahead of them and onto the top of that ridge. Uh, let's, let's bounce ourselves back across to Tristan in South Africa, who I imagine hasn't had to slip and slide in mud for quite a considerable period of time. And slipping and sliding can be some of the most fun when in a Land Rover. It often is quite a challenge, but it can be lots of fun. And I've had many a memorable drive trying to negotiate muddy roads. I remember in 2012, it was a sort of a, probably about two months worth of slipping and sliding all over the show and being stuck and all kinds of other things. And we know that um, Byron is especially adept at getting stuck since he often used to wear his little pink um, bullet case belt thing what would we call it? A bullet holder, I suppose. That ammo pouch is the right name. There we go. I'll get there eventually. But Byron used to have his little pink ammo pouch. We've got photographic evidence. So it does happen even here in the Sabi Sands. And hopefully this year will be one of those years where we will slip and slide all over the place with lots and lots of rain. But alas, besides where we've kind of driven, there's not really been much going on. We have seen very little. A few trucks for impalas. There's been... Uh, that's about it, actually. I haven't really seen anything else, not even any birds to be speaking of just yet, which I would assume would be the case. It is still quite warm. Even though there's a bit of cloud cover, it is still a little on the warm side at the moment, and so most of the birds will probably still be in the shade and not too active, and you'll find that a lot of the raptors will still be circling and riding thermals, looking for food, and you'll find then a number of 
the animals are still sitting in the shade. Now, there is a little bird that just flew off. I think it's a golden-breasted bunting, but you can't be too careful at the moment. There are a couple of the cinnamon-breasted buntings around as well, but I think this individual, there it is on the bottom right, Fuldi. Bottom right, there we go, a little bit more, there we go, there it is. Yes, it's a golden-breasted bunting, so that is what we have there. And they do have, they are beautiful birds. From the back, they look so drab and dreary and as though there's not really much color there. And then all of a sudden, they turn around and bang, they hit you with this bright yellow, kind of orangey color. It is very, very pretty. And then they've got that black and white facial mask that you see there. It is very cool to see. I like these little golden-breasted buntings. And they've been prolific in this early part of summer. We've seen them all over the place, particularly at Treehouse Dam. It's actually one of the best places to see them. I was sitting at Treehouse Dam that, the other day with Osana and watching how many of these came down to drink. It was actually staggering to see the amount of these guys around. So nice to see again and a good way to start off our birding afternoon. I think while we're kind of driving around all these un, sort of explored areas from the last few weeks, I think we're going to do a bit of birding. See, maybe there's some nests that we can discover that haven't we haven't seen just yet. Ultimately, all these areas are areas that I haven't spent too much time uh, for a second there I thought there might have been a European roller but it's a lilac breasted roller that's sitting on top there I just saw a bit of blue coloration just on the right here will be on that dead tree and so it's actually a lilac breasted roller but as I came around the bush I just saw this kind of blue bum and I was thinking to myself I wonder if it could be a European roller it would of course be way way too early for them and generally the European rollers are only arriving in about December so this would be very early but you know, sometimes it happens and you never know if there's been a few storms or high winds um, north of us that sometimes blow some of these migratory birds down a little earlier than normal now I also hear a black-bellied bustard here somewhere. It called quite far away. I wonder if it's not further up ahead. Did you hear it, Vim? I don't know where it is. They are masters of camouflage, these black-bellied bustards. Even though they have this bright black chest, if they've got their back to you and they're not close, it is very difficult to see them. But I want to just check. There's a couple little raised points, and black-bellied bustards love to sit on raised points and call. And so I wonder if maybe on that termite mound over there is not where our black bird where our black-bellied bustard is. It could be. Come on, black-bellied bustard, show yourself. No, not on the termite mound, unfortunately. So, Graham, I wonder if that's Graham as in Big Boss Graham. He says, a challenge for summer, a thick billed cuckoo on camera. Sure thing, no problem. I will do my level best to get a thick billed cuckoo on camera. Like I say, they are seen here. I saw many last summer, um, and I saw some red helmet strikes along the Mulawati, particularly up near Buffelsook Dam. So I'm going to try and check as much as I can for a thick billed cuckoo. I'm pretty sure I can find one at some point and get it on camera. We've got a long summer ahead of us and if we get cracking now I hope that we will be able to find one I'm pretty sure there will be one at some point somewhere that we'll be able to get on camera so Vildi challenge accepted isn't it sounds like it there we go so we will get a thick build cuckoo at some point I am going to do my level best now of course it's a little difficult on this particular area because we don't have much of the sort of riverine bush. Now, if you go into the Sand and Sabi River and along the Manuleti River in the summer months, lots of thick-billed cuckoos on those rivers because of the amount of riverine bush, which houses a lot of red helmet trikes. And the thick-billed cuckoos parasitize the red helmet trikes as much as they can. And so if you find red helmet trikes, you generally will find thick-billed cuckoos somewhere nearby. And so we just got to keep looking and find that flock that we see a lot around Nyala Road North and see if the thick billed cuckoos are not hanging around there. I suspect we can find one. I'm sure we can. I wonder if Brent has actually seen one in, on Juma because, or any of the Juma guides. I don't know. I think somebody did tell me yesterday, James Richard, I think t tagged me in a tweet and said that he has a thick billed cuckoo on his list, which means it has been seen and so I'm pretty sure we can get one on camera at some stage in the next a few months during the summer months. Now, 
I've just come past Impala Plains and, and onto the Impala Lines area, so I do apologize if there's a little bit of breakup. Sometimes when we go under the power lines, it provides a bit of interference. That's normally on Rusty. Wendy's typically okay. Rusty sometimes just has a little issue with the power line, so I'm just apologizing now in case. There's also a good road to check for Mvula. Now, I know Mvula yesterday was on his civet kill in the north, and he, I think, finished it and was left going southwards. So that would mean that he might pop out anywhere around Sydney's Dam, Sandy Patch, those places. And so this is a good area to check for them. Luther, um, migratory birds, it depends on the species. Some of them will be here um, and, and leave fairly early in the summer. Others leave a little bit later. It just depends on the different species. We generally find most of them, though, start leaving us at around sort of mid-March and towards the end of March, and most of them are gone by mid-April. It's very seldom that you have many staying beyond that. Sometimes the woodland kingfishers, if we get a late rain, you'll see them even up until almost May. I think this year we had quite late rain in April, and we were seeing Jacobin cuckoos and and woodland kingfishers even into to late May. So it, they do sometimes stick around if you get a bit of late rain, but most of them will be departing in the March-April period. That's when we see a lot of migratory species. Others, even earlier than that, so the, the carmine beaters, I've seen them leaving already in February sometimes. So it just depends on our rainfall. It depends on um, insect availability because most of our migratory birds are insect eaters or predators or birds of prey that hunt those insect eaters. And so it's very seldom them that you get seed eaters or um, those kind of birds migra migrating and the reason why they don't have to worry is because obviously there's food all year round whereas insect life is only very very high in the summer. This, the most difficult bird to see in Juma is, is a difficult one because birds being as mobile as they are often end up going into places that you would never expect them. So there's a lot of birds that could be vagrants here that you know you wouldn't expect to be here and a prime example of that, we were talking about this a few days ago, is the golden pippet that I saw in January. Brent has had a corn crake which does occur here but very difficult to see. Um, purple banded sunbird, not something that you should see here. There was a a sooty tern that was seen in the western Sabi sands of, um, in the last summer. So there's a lot of different birds that could potentially get here. Of the birds that occur here a lot and, and should be resident, I would say the corn crake that Brent saw at the beginning of the year would be a really difficult one. Um, and then Narina trogans, they also a really tough bird to see. They're a beautiful green bird with red on the chest. In fact, I'll actually try and get a picture for you so that you can see what it looks like. They are absolutely phenomenal beautiful so while I'm driving I'm doing this hopefully we won't have an accident and the reason why I'm doing this and not stopping while I'm driving is because there's a car behind me and I wanted to just get off the road so let's just stop here there we go so this is the Narina Trogan and the bird that I'm hoping one day we'll be able to put on camera it is an absolutely beautiful bird big emerald green back red sort of front and then this bright yellow beak so that's what we're to hope for at some point but there's a number of other rare species that could potentially occur here that the list could be quite long now while I go and negotiate the northern parts of Juma and see what's happening around Sydney Dam let's go back to Jamie who I don't know what she's up to because Rebecca did tell me but I was too busy yabbering on about Narina Trogans which gets me all excited and so I wasn't paying enough attention I'm sorry Rebecca but let's see where Jamie is and what she's up to Okay, I know that feeling, Tristan, very well. Um, what we have for you is a jackal that's eating something. I, I'm not entirely sure what it was. I thought at first it was a baby. T not a hundred percent sure. I think it might have been. No, it is a. It's a scrub hair. I think it's. A, is that a scrubby? I wonder if that's because earlier on the cheetah actually. Goodness. The cheetah actually chased the scrub hare and it went dashing off, not quite in this direction, but maybe if it panicked, it could easily have run straight into the direction of this jackal. No, it looks a bit... No, it is a scrub hare. It must be. That must be the scrub hare. So the cheetah chased the scrub hare and it went racing off here. And, oh, the poor thing. It must have escaped the cheetah and gone straight into the jaws of the jackal. Oh, jaws of the jackal. It sounds like a Tom Clancy novel. Absolutely. Um, but the jaws of the jackal have ended the life of the scrub hare. 
doesn't have quite the same ring to it when I say it like that. Uh, we're sitting on the top of the ridge and the, the cheetah are actually making their way, or were making their way in this direction. So there's a chance, depending on what how the situation plays out, there's a chance they could actually, we could see the cheetah steal from a jackal. So we'd get the real full circle of predators stealing from from other things. But now they've just, just gone beyond where we can see them. Unfortunately, we don't have signal down in this gap. As you can see, possibly, um, oh, they're there. Can you see them, Ferg? Back of them popping out. They'll, they'll pop up soon. They'll be here soon. They're probably going to go to that gardenia and scent mark. And then I think they'll probably come around here and they'll pop up. There is a herd of wildebeest up ahead of us, but I, I really doubt that they're going to go racing in the direction of the wildebeest, not as close as they are to those lionesses. I, w I wouldn't have thought. If they do do that, then their, their um, lion avoidance strategy really needs a rethink, because then it completely explains why they lose kills. It would be very silly to go for these wildebeest now, because the lionesses will just come and steal them again. If they heard that kill from where they were, which was pretty far, by, judging by their roars, if that was them roaring. They hear, they can hear a kill over a kilometre away. There we go. Ah, look at that. What do you know? Did they go and send Mark at the Gardenia? Yeah. So as our cheetah approach and scent mark on the gardenia and make their way in the direction of our jackal that's nibbling on a scrub hair, Alan, um, jackal and hyena are not related. Well, I mean, if you go back far enough, yes, they are related because they're part of the carnivore order. But no, they are not. Jackals are part of the dog family. They're a true canid. Whereas hyenas are part of a completely separate family that is not a cat and not a dog. It's called the hyena day family, as as I suppose makes sense. No, they they are not. The, and if you go back in terms of their family line, they are slightly more closely related to cats than they are to dogs. So no, not related to jackal at all, and very very different in terms of the niche that they fill in the ecosystem. You're not surely going to do it, boy. Z, boys. Surely not. I don't think so. Look at that. Clean faces. Completely cleaned. After their very rapid lunch. It's wonder they don't get indigestion. Ilana, um, the leading cause of death, I'd be interested to know the to know the actual statistic. So Ilana, who is 14 years old and one of our regular viewers, is wondering about the leading cause of death for cheetah. Oh, they've been spotted as well. Um, Ilana, I'd be interested to know exactly what percentage it is. I think that you'll probably find that the um, highest mortality for cheetah comes from lions, and second to that would probably be hyenas. Uh, that, of course, I'm thinking specifically cubs. Uh, leopards will also kill cheetah cubs, and interestingly enough, so will baboons and buffalo. And in fact, I think you'd find, especially in places where they, they really have found a secret and safe den site, um, something like a, a, a baboon or a leopard would be more threatening to their cubs than, say, a lion up towards the rocky areas. But I'd be interested to know, and I'm sure there's studies done into exactly what the the sort of highest percentage of death in cheetahs is caused by. Ah, uh, my money's on lion. Lions often go out of their way to kill other predators. Not that, not, nothing wrong with that. It's just one of those things. It's their natural instinct to reduce competition. And the fact that they're just the biggest thing out here makes them the biggest threat. Look how soggy you are still. You can really see how much it rained. They must be absolutely drenched. Okay, you've still got a little bit of, bit of blood on your cheeks. Your buddy missed a spot. They're interesting, these five musketeers. They really are fascinating to watch. They go from cuddling together to fighting to scrapping. I'm going to go for the jackal. 
<laughs> that chase. Oh, I can't reverse, unfortunately. I'm sorry, Ferg. There's a person behind me. I can't redirect us. Oh, there goes the jackal with the scrub hair kill. Are the cheetah going to go chasing off after it? Let's see. Let's stick here for now. They're going to pop out from behind this car shortly. No. I think the jackal got Scott got away scot free there. I think I might have heard this wrong, but I think uh, Rebecca, please can you repeat the name? Makeup by Makeup by Uh, Makeup by Asia. Right, uh, Rebecca, I think, read my mind as to what I'd heard. Makeup by Asia. Jackals live in family groups, so they're monogamous. They are. They have their own little territories, and they live a male and a female together, and then they pups as well. So once they raise a litter of pups, the lovely thing about jackal is that they will actually keep a... a they, they'll stick around their mom and their dad and help them raise their next set of siblings. So they'll actually help to raise the next set of pups, which I find quite, quite lovely about them. One of my favorite things about Jackal. They're really, truly fascinating little creatures. And I'm sorry that I missed the scrub hare hunt because I've never seen one before. I've never seen a Jackal hunt a scrub hare. It's so beautiful. It really is the most beautiful afternoon. Here come the lapwings. They're sniffing around where the where the jackal had the had the scrub hair kill, looking to see if there's anything remaining. I'm so impressed with that jackal. I can't believe it got away with that actually. <laughs> it's probably because they're a little bit tired after the the drama of the past hour or so. Oh oh oh! Oh, just trotting to catch up. Sometimes they trot like that, and then all of a sudden they, a fight breaks out, without any apparent cause. Okay, everybody stop to sniff. Yep. Scrub hair, all right. And Jackal. Off Dart goes. That's D'Artagnan with the collar. And five elegant shapes making their way up and over the horizon. And would you know it, back to balloon crossing. Or at least in the vague direction of balloon crossing. My personal Bermuda Triangle of the Mara. And off they march. And of course, we are all gently serenaded by the sound of the vehicles as they drive past. That is, of course, track one of our Safari Live Mara musical CD that will be released later, featuring country specials like Muddy Rodeo. And the melancholy blues number, Is That a Lion or Am I Sleep Deprived? And a hard rock number featuring guitar and vocals by James Hendry. Dust in my eye and a bug up my nose. And a car in my shot. <laughs> And a special bonus track, which is Wildebeest canoeing for six hours. And we, of course, have somebody to thank for that amazing afternoon with the Musketeers. And that was Brent, who, who found them this morning and told us where to go. Uh, he had other plans in mind for his afternoon. Let's go and explore a brand new patch of the Mara with him. Welcome everyone, and we are in about the most far-flung reaches of the Mara we've ever, ever been. And uh, we, we did try to show you a waterfall or two on the Sand River, unfortunately. It was just beyond our reach. But as I say, we are expanding constantly. And one of the things that we've been doing at the moment is exploring new areas of Mara and working out whether it is worth popping up antennas and whatnot to reach certain areas. And I must say... 
撒盐了。It is incredible. It is so. There we go. Sebastian agrees. It is so different from the rest of the Mara. So we in 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 scrubland. Um, we've had a lot of leopard tracks. This is one of the few areas you can actually track. Um, we are on quartz soils with um, sand roads, and lots of hilly hilly areas, and lots of black rhino sign. We haven't seen them yet. Well, the only thing we've seen so far is lions and a waterfall, and. Uh, we're right, right. We're probably about as far from Angama and our our, our base camp as we can get. Um, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm actually going to have to ask for final control because they've got a map that tells them where I am. And we're, I'm guessing we're probably about 50 or 60 kilometers in a straight line. So driving wise, we're about 130 kilometers plus minus from base camp. And uh, it has been a really wonderful day. We've explored. And, and, and we've got a wonderful ranger with us, Harrison, who's, who's helped us explore. And we've even gone out and, 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 and seen areas that I don't think many er people have seen in the last 20 years. And that is one of the wonderful things about being in an area like this. We just get this vast expanse. Um, so the whole Sabi Sands, the whole Sabi Sands, every reserve in the Sabi Sands is 60,000 hectares, which is about 130,000 acres. Now, the Mara is about 150,000 hectares, so over 300,000 acres, and we've only touched probably a quarter, or maybe a half, let me be honest, maybe half, and uh, seven, and I've taken on ourselves to, to, to go into new areas, and it's incredible that we, we've realized without too much effort, we've got signal and comms in, in areas that we, we thought would never be possible. And uh, who knows what incredible characters, and especially in this area, I'm very excited about the black rhinos. So there are only 30, 35, 36, Harrison, how many black rhinos? 45 black rhinos in the whole Mara. We know there are 12 in the triangle, and, and the rest are in this area. And out of that 45 black rhino, there are 12 in the triangle. We know there's about five or six between Lookout, Salas, Sand River. The rest of those 45 black rhino live in this area, and it is absolutely gorgeous. And uh, I mean, clouds aside, because there's a lot of big rain clouds around, and I'm always ecstatic to explore a new area. And uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to show you some of this new area as we move through it. And uh, we might or might not be able to show you lots or little. And as I say, it's it's an adventure and it's and it's an exploration of a completely new area. And um, as I say, I'm, I'm over, the, over the moon to be able to explore a new area. But Taylor has some elephants, but hopefully we're gonna be able to share a bit more of this area with you. But as I said, Taylor, I think she might have even gone back to the same herd of elephants she had this morning. But uh, hopefully we've got some fantastic creature like an odd fuck or well, I'm feeling odd wolf. That's what I'm feeling this evening. And I'm being overconfident, but let's go see Taylor and Eddie's. Great. <laughs> that was the longest link in the history of linking across to another presenter. I'm, I really feel like we all need to agree on this. We always tease each other at work that it's James's pet hate is when you take too long to go across to his feed, but Brent has taken the cake today. Tristan is normally number one. I'm sorry, Tristan, you've gone down to two now. Brent is up there on top. Poor Bex was talking for about an hour before <laughs> she, she came across to me. But we do have elephants. They are still here. Luckily, it's a big open space. And uh, if they do move further and further away from the car, you can, you can kind of still see them. But um, they're heading back up home towards the escarpment, towards the trees. There's been so much rain around here this afternoon. Not quite down in the triangle, but up around in Gama Camp and, and pretty much the entire escarpment. You can see it brewing back there. Uh, so, elephants, I hope you know that that's the weather that you're going to get in lots of thunder. It's been raining since about top past two this afternoon, in fact. But there's a little one nudging up to most likely an older sibling. And it is quite a young elephant, and it has lost its tail. And there's quite a few youngsters we have seen with a little stumpy tail. Whether it's the same one or not, it's quite hard to tell. It seems to be very common in the Mara. 
But either way, they have been playing in the mud today. Much earlier, though, when it was a bit warmer, it got quite chilly as uh, the weather came about. Although I have seen elephants also having mud baths regardless of the temperature. You know, actually, sometimes just after you've had a downpour, uh, the water will loosen up some of an elephant's favorite soil. Maybe each elephant has a different uh, or a preferred sort of soil, uh, and then they'll often splash around in baths. But they're moving away, and our goal this afternoon is going to be... Uh, lions, yes, we're going to do lions, I was thinking. We should have to change our plan though. Oh my goodness, Darby, we might have to change it again. Look at the rain. Another one. We cannot have another downpour today. So we, we've we basically, well, I closed the tent and opened it, or David and I closed and opened the tent. It must have been about a hundred times today. And I hope we don't have to do it again. So we were going to go down west, sort of, and do the river route, but I'm not because that's where all the rain is. So we're going to be driving in the, this in sort of northeastern corner. And we'll check the Mara River. We'll have a look around here. So who knows what we may find, of course. But heading down to the Mara River in this area means that the Nganas could be on the menu or perhaps the Ololoro females. We will travel around and have a look. Let's jump back on board with Tristan. Well, I wish you luck, Taylor. I hope that you do have some success and that you do not get rained on too much. But we have managed to find two little cute hyenas of our own. So this is going to be... A quite a short sighting unfortunately because there's no adults around so we're just showing you a quick glimpse of them ultimately the den is they're still too young to be here without the adults and so we're just showing you guys that they're still well happy and alive and doing just fine now the darker one which is, seems to be the more dominant of the two from the last few sightings we've had is lying right out in the open is chewing a bit of grass and i'm sure at this age the teething is out of control and so everything is a chew toy they chew grass and sticks and bones and anything really that they can get their little teeth on and the other one is lying quite safely inside the den at the entrance and looks very fast asleep i suppose it's a snoozy kind of day it's a warmish clammy afternoon there's a bit of cloud cover a bit of a breeze and so why not take a little afternoon siesta and take it very easy but such cute little things and they're growing by the day i actually can't believe how big they are considering when we first saw them and it feels like just yesterday that we had these tiny little hyena cubs running around in this area and now we've got these kind of two I suppose they're not big but they they're much larger than what they were and far naughtier and far braver than what we saw a few weeks or months ago they're now actually starting to come out and go around all over the place and they seem to be quite curious when we first arrived they kind of came towards us and then they got a bit of a fright from the impalas that are just behind the termite mound there's two impalas that are actually quite close and then they went scuttling back towards there and they've now both settled in this particular area and are taking it quite nice and chilled. I wonder where the adults are. I would have thought that maybe if they were out like this that the adults would be somewhere close by but I've scanned all over and I've checked around the den. There's no sign of any of the adults being here. Maybe they've found themselves some shade a little further afield and are still in close enough reach that if something were to happen and these little ones were to squeal that they'd be here in a matter of two seconds. So maybe that's why the little ones are still out and about. But look at how long the legs are of the one on the left. You can see they're getting massive and I love when hyenas are this age because they look awkward They become these animals that have long legs and their small little body and it kind of looks as though they trip over themselves Because they haven't quite grown into these legs just yet and those front legs in particular We know that the hyenas have <clears throat> much longer front legs than they do back legs And so it kind of takes them a bit of time to actually grow into them and become The right sort of proportion to be able to actually control what's going on but that's very cool. I'm so glad that they are starting to get a lot more relaxed with us. Uh, uh, first few times, I think if we had come here, they would have scuttled in and wouldn't have come out. But you can see they're not even paying any attention to me. Even with me talking, I haven't had one of them really look at us since we turned off the car. They've become very chilled. You can see also that there's a bit of scratching going on. So even though this is a fairly new den site for them, I would imagine that the fleas are starting to build up inside there. And so they will scratch and itch quite a lot.
So Lana, who's 14 years old, um, Lana, so hyenas have a bit of a different system to what the lions do in terms of introducing their young ones to the clan. What you find with hyenas is that there's a very, very rigid social structure, so it's not quite like the lions where the lions, there will be lionesses, and, and yes, there will be a, a kind of lead lioness, but it's not really that sort of structured, whereas with hyena society, the, there will be a matriarchal female, and then there will be hyenas that follow on from her until you get the lowest ranking member. And according to how they kind of sit within the clan will dictate how early these little ones are exposed to the rest of them. Generally you find the matriarchal female, normally the, the other hyenas, because they follow that matriarch around and then they kind of are submissive to her, they often meet the little ones quite early on and they then get kind of pushed away and they go off. But these little ones, which are from the, probably the lowest ranking member of the clan that we have here, as far as I know, they have not yet seen any of the matriarchs. I suppose it could have happened at night when we're not around, but as far as I know, the matriarchal females have, or well, the high ranking females let's call it, have not come into this area just yet and so these little ones haven't met anybody and don't know the rest of the clan that well because generally the low ranking females will den away from the high ranking females and split off during their denning period because they just are that low down and, and the adult sort of the matriarchs will take over the best denning spots and so these guys then get pushed aside a little bit. So it's not the same as where they'll have a den and then once they become big enough they then get introduced you'll find a situation that as they get a little bit older so they then get taken um, well, they start moving around on their own, and then from there they start interacting with little bits of the clan, and it depends on whether they are male or female as to how they will be seen within the grouping. If they are males, they're going to be quite low-ranking, particularly because they come from a low-ranking female. They're going to maintain that rank, and even as a female, actually, they will be the same. If they were high-ranking males, or a high-ranking female, and they were male cubs, then you would find that they'd sit much higher on the food chain than any of the other males, but at the end of the day, these are low-ranking individual that had these and so she's these are ones whether they're male or female are going to be right at the bottom now Rebecca did ask me a question and I've forgotten exactly what the question was so Rebecca if you can just repeat that for me you can see the one is just grooming a little bit there we go so Bree Bree so you're asking what are the differences of ages between these two well I would imagine a mere minutes given that they are from the same mother so both of these two are from the same mom they are part of the same litter and they do not come from different mothers the one is a lot darker than the other one and that's just a genetic thing it's just that it's developing its spot slightly later and what's interesting about this is that generally when you see a hyena that doesn't have um, well, spots and it's dark like that you would think that's still very young and particularly um, the one that's a little bit more spotted would be a little bit more dominant but actually in this case the darker one is the more dominant of the two now unfortunately like I said I'm going to have to leave our two little hyena cubs even though they're so cute because there's no adults present. and so while I carry on and see what else I can find I believe Jamie has got four beautiful spotted predators of her own but are also taking a little bit of a nap I've got five spotted predators being watched by a very soggy looking Tommy. So soggy Tommy's watching soggy cheetahs, having had a little bit of a scrap in the bright green grass. Now my hope, and, and it was working out beautifully, we had all five of them walking together, the theme tune of the Magnificent Seven was playing in my head, and they were all walking towards us, towards a gardenia, uh, their favorite gardenia actually, and then they went and laid down, really far away from us. And I'm thoroughly unimpressed because they gave me false hope and I know they're coming to this gardenia because I've seen them here mark this gardenia many, many, many times. So I know they're coming here and I thought I was getting ahead of the game a little bit, you know. They're going to make their way here. But uh, they decided to sit down for a while. I can't blame them though. Um, the sun's only just come out and they're probably freezing <laughs> after all that. They're so soggy. Oh, Lana, you want to know what would happen with cheetah, with cheetah with similar genes if they kept breeding? Funny thing is, is that cheetah do have very similar genes. Of all of the animals out here, there is very, very little genetic difference between individual cheetahs. And that's because there was a, a bottleneck uh, quite a long time ago, so about 10,000 years ago, possibly even longer. Cheetah, there, there were very few cheetah left in the world. And as a result, those cheetah bred with each other and created a situation where there's very little ge genetic variety between cheetahs. So in theory, you could graft... <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Um... 
Oof. You could graft skin from one individual cheetah onto another. I'm really sorry if that gave everyone a bit of a fright. I didn't have time to give you a warning. Um, so uh, this is what cheetah do. Is cheetah very similar to each other? Do breed with each other? If let's say um, you were to get a situation where a very limited population of cheetah kept breeding you would have a situation where you'd have inbreeding and that is what often results is you get genetic defects and usually one or two generations is okay but if that inbreeding continues then you'll start to get things like dwarfism which I've seen in lions before and it was one of the most depressing things I've ever seen in one of those um, highly, highly unpleasant cub petting areas, and it was it just so happened that we were driving past, and some of the, these cubs came to the ca the edge of the fence and looked at us, and they they were clearly suffering from a form of dwarfism. They had stunted legs, and uh, it was really it was really very sad. Um, so you get those sorts of genetic abnormalities. It was also a situation where you find that the cheetah are not resistant to disease or change which of course is one of the reasons why cheetah are endangered as it is because they don't have that same resilience that other species do that have different genetics I can't do it anymore I cannot sit here and watch these cheetah and listen to the guinea fowl alarm calling I'm sorry I can't not for the second time today I had to ignore them earlier because we were these guys were about to get up I have to go and see why they're sitting in the tree and calling they're not alarm calling as much as they were we'll come back here these boys are coming inside they're not alarm calling as much as they were uh, maybe they're not sitting in the tree maybe that's a vulture and some shadows let's just go find out vultures in a tree. Now just bear with me one moment because I think I've made a mistake and I think what I thought were guinea fowl. You're not a guinea fowl. Oh that's a deep puddle. It is a lovely shot. Shall we have a stop there? And have a look at the vulture that's sunning itself. The combination of the strange shaped tree and then the vulture from a backwards angle made me think it was guinea fowl sitting in a tree. Oh, Rebecca, sorry, please remind me of that name again. I actually didn't hear you this time around. It wasn't that I wasn't listening. I couldn't hear you. Hampers? Hampers. Hampers. You want to know what the most difficult bird to see in the Maasai Mara is? Oh, it's a, it, there's a couple of different suggestions. We actually talked about this quite a bit yesterday on the Sunset Safari. Um, one of the examples would be a blue swallow, which I missed out on. Um, the Somali bee eater that Brent is convinced that he saw. And um, <laughs> there were three recorded cases of a shubal once in 1994. But no, that that's not that wouldn't count because they don't really occur in the Mara. So those are just some of the examples. What you really need to do is go birding into the sort of river river areas, in the thick trees, and then you sit and you look. And the more time you spend there, the more chance you'd actually have of seeing some quite unusual birds lurking around that area. Okay. <laughs> what, what What's happening there, Faye? It was a splendid starling. Oh, it was a splendid starling. Ah, I see. <laughs> Such a splendid starling. Well, this is a splendid shot of a leopard-faced vulture, but I'm going back to those cheetah because next thing they'll come to that gardenia while I'm away. And then I will be very upset with them. Okay, I'm going to get back to where our cheetah are making their way towards. Let's go across to Taylor. I didn't hear what she has, uh, and Rebecca's not entirely sure what it was. Well, it would be nice if we could hear this bird's call. <laughs> but, Jamie, enjoy your cheetah sightings. Now, David has already shouted at this bird. He said, don't you dare, because it looked like it was about to fly, just as uh, we were linking or being linked to. And that's uh, the common thing with birds. But this is a white-browed kukul, and because we've had so much rain, it is truly fitting. And I've been listening to them for most of the day, calling. It looks like it's about to jump out of frame, and off it goes. 
just hopping to the next branch, but very nice. And I'm still waiting for the day that I can get a sighting of one hunting and chasing a lizard or a snake or, you know, big armored ground cricket or, I don't know, something through the grass and then devouring it. So we had some little whispers in the non-existent wind today that there are a couple of lions not too far away from us. Sounds like two males and a female. Whether they're mating or not, well, not sure we're going to have to go and find out. Could be quite interesting with two males around. Uh, we know that they'll sort of compete for dominance. So that could be quite good, but we just need to try and find them now. And I think that they're closer towards Little Governor's Camp. So it's not too far away, except I've just chosen to drive on the bumpiest roads today. Right. Making sure I actually see where I'm going and don't drive us into an area where we're going to get stuck. I actually see some vehicles up ahead, so I wonder if that means lion. But before we even get to the lion, there's a couple of buffalo around too. Hmm, okay, not much around in terms of food for lions. A few warthogs here and there, and a couple of buffalo which is quite normal, we, but I'm actually going to try and concentrate on navigating these roads and head towards the lions on the cars. Let's go back to Brent. It looks like he's in the jungle. Well, Sebastian and I are both feeling at home. It's a, it's a palm tree like we used to encounter in our days in Gabon. Um, it is a Phoenix reclinata or the wild date palm. Now, the really cool thing is, there we go, Seb, if you focus in on there, is the, the fruit kernel of the wild dead palm. Those are expired fruit kernels, but it attracts huge amounts of different animals. Birds, rodents, and even jackal will eat uh, the fruiting palm. Now, as I say, we're in an area that is completely different to the rest of the Mara that we used to, and... Uh, if we have a look, we're actually in Acacia Savanna at the moment. So I'm going to slide backwards a tiny bit. And we... Now, I've been a lot of places in Africa, and I must say, this is one of the most beautiful valleys I've been in. Now, we're in, surrounded by Acacia Savanna at the moment. We've got Acacia Tortillas, uh, amongst others. And there's lots of giraffe around, or unfortunately none at this very moment. And uh, this lovely lush green lawn that has been grazed by the wildebeest. So the wildebeest have been in this valley and they have absolutely mowed every bit of grass. Now, a lot of people look at areas like this. See where they're like this, where you have erosion and they try to fix it and stuff. But in certain areas, erosion is natural. It is where the water runs off the hills and comes down and adds nutrients into the soil so at the bottom of these little valleys where you've got erosion like we are completely surrounded at the moment it is actually an explosion of nutrition and that's why you have this carpet of absolutely perfect almost golf course like green grass and acacia trees that are tall now the elephants come through here and they will feed on this but acacia trees and especially in this proximity to each other will have that chemical defense uh, to send elephants moving along. So a whole area, maybe 200 acres of acacia trees, if one acacia gets fed on too much, the, elef uh, the, the acacias will talk to each other through chemical signals and the elephants will have to move. And I, I must say, this area is just absolutely astounding. We are in a valley between those hills that you will see shortly that Seb's gonna, Seb's gonna show you there. And the hills to the left of us, are actually Tanzania. So just beyond us is Tanzania. And um, Harrison, how far? One kilometer, 500 meters, Tanzania. One kilometer from us is Tanzania. And it is, for me, so astounding. It is so different from the rest of the Mara. And uh, Riti is wondering about the Phoenix Reclinata, or the wild date palm, um, which we have seen more in the last 45 minutes than I think I've seen in my whole six, seven months in Kenya. There's a lovely big one right there. And Riti's wondering if that fruit is, 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 
is edible to humans. It is. And not only is the fruit edible to humans, and Sebastian, being from Gabon, will know about this quite well. Um, if we go down onto the, onto the stalk, you can tap the stalk. Sebastian, how much palm wine have you drunk in your life? <laughs> There's a giggle. Never, never. Never, never, which we know is a lie. So there's an alcoholic beverage in most places in Africa where the Phoenix Reclinata occurs, um, which might be a little bit stronger than a, than a glass of water that is made um, from different palms. And Phoenix Reclinata is actually one of the, the best palm wines. Uh, I must say, as uh, to be 100% honest, I find palm wine absolutely vile. I do not enjoy it. I do not think it is nice. But, um, Sebastian, what do you think of palm wine? Musungu. <laughs> Mzungu. Yeah, Mzungu. Mzungu. Oh, Mzuri. Mm. Sebastian likes palm wine. I think it's horrible. Absolutely <laughs> disgusting. Clayton, you are spot on. When when these palms fruit, the elephants will definitely feed on them. Now, what what I find incredibly interesting about palms in, den, in general, whether it be a, a wild date palm or a lala palm or a hyacinia palm, which occur, different palms occur all over Africa, the elephants will feed on the fruit. When it drops, and that, that, that fruit is already dropped, that is an expired flower, uh, they will not break down the actual branches of the palm. And they will not de eat the leaves. Now, Rebecca, I'm going to be very naughty and I'm going to drive up to that palm tree. So, as I said, we're in a new area. We've never been here before. But I'm hoping um, we, 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 we might we, you might lose us. Uh, I'm hoping we don't. But if we lose comms, it's okay because I understand there's a little dip in front of us. And I'll grab a leaf and we'll go up onto the next ridge where we have comms. But if, if we do lose picture, I do apologize. And I will take the leaf to the next place we have picture. So let's go on an adventure because today has been all about adventure. Okay, let's go. <laughs> and poor Sebastian, his first ever with me. Um, const hey, Sebastian's loving it, but um, oh my goodness, just as he was about to pick the fruit, just teasing. Sorry about that, everybody. These things happen, of course, but we are not too far away from some lions. I saw some lion colored things laying in the grass not too far ahead. There's actually now all of a sudden a lot of game. The area that we were in before, a couple of buffalo, like I said, and a few warthog. But now, before we even get to the lions, we bouncy bounce. Look at this abundance of game. Huge herd of, almost said wildebeest, buffalo. A couple of zebra, all moving around, grazing, completely oblivious. And then there's also quite a few topi just to the right of those buffalo. But if those lions are mating, whether they'd be too hungry, I'm not so sure. In Eland as well, a whole herd of Eland. So there's plenty, plenty of food around. This could be good hunting grounds for lions this evening, and there are no shortage of them in this area. But let's move on. Let's head up to where I saw the tan-colored things laying in the grass, right up against the lugger. If you remember, it was yes, not yesterday morning, the morning before, when David and I had gone out on safari, and towards the last hour of the show, we just had lion after lion after lion. And it was along this lugger. So obviously the pride of lions that we'd seen, we'd seen the two males and we saw some laying the shade. There must have been a female within that group that was in Estrus. So there's the lugger there. I apologize, the road. These roads are so bumpy when you're not on the main roads. <clears throat> and I have a little tickle in my throat this afternoon. Now the water's running. Not quite the raging Mulwati that we're used to seeing, but it's uh, it's something. We actually didn't get that much rain. It's amazing how quickly the water subsides as well. That uh, really does surprise me. Okay, we're almost here, I promise. We're actually on the other side of the lugger, and we went there first. We didn't have a great view, unfortunately, so we decided to go all the way around. Now, Rafael, you're wondering if... I've ever gotten lost in the bush. Oh yeah, I'm specialist at getting lost. I actually have three gold stars. 
Uh, so yeah, no, you all, everybody gets lost when they get good. I always find, I always say as well that the first property you need to, you work on is the hardest to learn because, and not just because of the layout of the land, but it's all the things you've got to remember when you first start guiding, your first guiding job, you've got to talk to your guests, you've got to remember where you're going, make sure you get close enough to the lodge at night because you don't really know uh, how to navigate just yet. You get there. It takes a bit of time. But here we are. Isn't this beautiful? Now Brent was in an oasis earlier. I think that this is quite pretty. I love the little bits of vegetation that do grow along, uh, grow along, grow along these luggers. And I can't see the second male. I can only see one male and a female tucked up there. And it's actually quite easy just from uh, without even seeing a mane to tell the difference. Now when we talk about how certain animals coloration will change as they become more mature particularly the males and it's it's well it goes for the lines you can see on the left look how much sort of darker in color is almost a gray rather than that typical uh, tawny color that is associated with lions the females won't really well I've never seen a dark female before but I've definitely seen um, males going almost gray in color and that normally happens when they get to about six or seven years old you can really start to see it shining through but I feel as though I need to try and convince you that they're alive because it doesn't even look like they're breathing, but they are alive. They're probably exhausted. So I don't know for how long they've been mating for, but, uh, but this surely, this, not surely, this most certainly does look like a mating pair. So we could wait five minutes. We could wait 10 minutes. We could make wait 25 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on how far along they are in their honeymoon. So... We will wait, and waiting is what we will do until these lions get up, and we can try and figure out exactly uh, how long they've still got to go. But let's go into Tristan's car and see if he's ever got lost. Well, hopefully at some point, Taylor, they'll get active and provide a show. But what we've got is a migratory bird and since we've been discussing birds most of the drive this is a lovely bird to see it's a Wahlberg's eagle in fact there's two of them here and they've been quite vocal they were flying around and Viam did a fantastic job of tracking them all the way to the boards of the tree and so it looks like both dark form individuals so there it goes flying off towards Gauri Dam side and you can see once it takes there look at how long that tail is and rectangular it's such a good IDing feature there's no other birds really that we see that have a same kind of structure and the other one is just above us here so I think maybe it might be flying around towards where the other one is perched you can see there it is sitting and this one is not as dark as the one that flew off this is slightly more kind of rusty brown than it is very dark although actually now that I look at it I suppose it is quite dark as well so it was really cool to see because both of them came off the ground and they were calling and they were kind of circling one another and then both landed in these marula trees and I was wondering if hopefully we we're going to see a bit of a courting display because it seems like it's like that that they calling so much and, and they were very vocal and there was this kind of intricate little pattern that they flew and then they both landed so I was hoping we'd see a little bit more from them but it's still nice to see and it's still always a pleasure when we get to watch our big birds of prey as in action now, I'm going to try and sneak forward and not disturb this bird I'm hoping that it will stay where it is given that some of these birds are just arriving from migrating they might be a little bit on the skittish side and not too used to vehicles our ones down at twin dams and and on uh, Wall Wahlberg's Road, they fairly relaxed, but these individuals not so much. These are new to the area, and so they tend to move away quite quickly. Oh, Riti, that's a good question. You want to know what the wingspan is of these eagles, but if you give me two seconds, I will tell you what the wingspan is. Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head, but I will be able to tell you in the next two seconds. Their wingspan is 1.4 meters, and so how, how much is that in feet? I was... Uh, I don't know. I, is that about five foot? Is somewhere around there, Vildi? I think so. 1.4, somewhere around there. If he says, don't ask me, as VM's reminded me on many times, because I try and ask him these things, he tells me that maths is not his strong point, and so I should stop asking him about maths questions, but I think it's somewhere around five feet. So quite a, a small wingspan in comparison to the vultures and the big martial eagles. 
4.6 feet. Okay, so we were quite far off. But I suppose 4.6 is still fairly big if you consider it is a bird and it's got to fly and that's a lot of weight and, and you've got to kind of propel yourself with those big wings. It's a lot of energy that gets exerted. And that's probably why also they're not flying far. They're just flying from kind of tree to tree. There's not very many thermals now. Now that the cloud cover has come over, it's, the temperature is really coming down now quickly. And so I have a feeling that we're going to see a situation where most of the birds are going to start landing now, especially birds of prey, and they're not going to be too active. Right, Buffalzook Dam. Let's see if we get lucky. Riti, you're asking if eagles will call to mate or if they is danger around. I don't know if it's they're calling each other to mate, but there's definitely will be calls to announce themselves and to kind of attract attention to them. So when there's the mating process, often birds are very vocal, not just eagles, most birds are very vocal during that time. And so you'll hear a lot of noise um, when they're trying to mate and a lot of squawking and carrying on. And then in terms of danger, yes, um, but in eagles, you don't see it as much because there's not that many dangerous things for an eagle, if you think about it. They're able to pretty much fly and there's very few eagles that hunt other eagles and so they don't have that many dangers but if they are in a nest and there's something like a snake you will hear them they will make quite a bit of noise and try and kind of deter that predator away by making noise and distracting its attention and getting rid of it so yes they do they communicate with each other is probably a better way to do it than actually attract attention towards each other now we've arrived at Buffalo's Hook Dam and unfortunately it seems as though my dry spell at Biffleshook Dam continues a little bit longer. I still have yet to have a really quality sighting at Biffleshook Dam itself. It seems as though always when I come here it's very quiet and I would have expected maybe even just a hippo but alas there is not much going on at all. So what is good about this dam is that there's lots of little nooks and crannies and little places where things can hide so always important when you get to a dam like this just to stop, look around. Sometimes you can be so kind of occupied with looking at the water that if you don't look on the fringe and around the tops on the banks and various other places and even to our right here down this drainage line you can sometimes miss things that are very obvious and I've seen it many times where you kind of drive this way and you forget about looking on the side where there's no water and there's something lying there or something that's feeding in the bush around in this case unfortunately nothing that I can see and nothing noteworthy to look at there's not really any birds around either I thought maybe we'd find some lapwings and I'm super excited because there was a sandpiper that was seen pretty much along the Sabi River inside the Kruger National Park but it is a sandpiper that doesn't normally occur here and so I'm hoping that we get a bit of a storm over this weekend and maybe blows that bird a little further west and here into the Sabi sand but I'll show you that bird just now and while I try to find it in the book let's go across to Brent who I believe is gazing into the abyss that is a hole in the tree. Well, look at that. Isn't that incredible? We can see the grass through one of the most important trees in the Mara. Now, I was discussing a palm that we don't get to see too often in the Mara, and I said the elephants will eat the fruit of the palm, but they don't eat the palm itself. And um, <laughs> Sebastian and I did a whole live segment when we went through that little dip, thinking we were alive, so I'm going to try and repeat what I said, because I thought what I said was very clever. But there's a very important reason why the elephants don't eat this particular branch and I, I managed to get an old branch that had, had had fallen off now the leaves themselves are very soft but they're very short in nutrients the young leaves however of a phoenix palm are very very rich in nutrients however they are literally like nine inch nails they would go straight through your shoe straight through your finger if you pushed hard enough I mean look at that now, I have fingers like leather, as you can see. My fingers look like they belong to a 70-year-old man. However, that's what happens when you live in the bush for long enough. You get calluses everywhere, so you can poke yourself with sharp things and not feel too much. <laughs> but there we go. So that's that's why elephants don't eat this, because the actual nutrient-rich part of, 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 of the palms is these young, young, young little branches. Now, this will turn into a lovely palm frond like this but there's so little nutrients or there's a lot of sand in here so it's just been in the sand so there's a lot of new there's almost no nutrients left in these in the, in, the, in the branches you can see I can grab them no problem but you move down a couple of centimeters and they are literally like nine inch nails you 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 could take a hammer and put that through a piece of wood now 
Palm trees aside, since we are out of the valley and I'm no longer trying to avoid stepping on palm trees, then another one of the most important trees in the Mara is, of course, the shepherd's tree. Now, Seb, you're going to have to talk to me because my comms are out. And uh, this, for me, is one of the greatest examples of a shepherd's tree because it is still alive, very, very much alive. But the fact is, it has been eaten by termites. So there are areas of this tree that are completely gone, and I can break them off with my hand. And not only have the termites gotten here, Seb, can you zoom in over there? You can see there's there's perfectly round little holes in there that are made by wood borer beetles or longhorn beetles that have managed to, after the termites have eaten off the protective bark layer, have, have managed to eat into this. And, and a shepherd's tree is a very soft wood uh, in comparison to some of your hardwoods. And that's why termites and borer beetles can get there. And it's called a shepherd's tree because in areas like the Maasai Mara, and the Karoo in South Africa, sorry, there we go, I'm trying to get comfortable. Um, it is the only shade available, not only to the animals, but to the people looking after domestic animals. So it's called a shepherd's tree because it's the only shade around. Now, normally, I would try climb the tree, but we have roofs on these cars, so apparently if I climb the tree, you're not going to be able to see me. So, yes, Seb says yes, I can't climb the tree. Well. What I can do is do that, then I can lean against the tree and say, okay, there we go. We are in one of the most spectacular areas. We're in Acacia Woodland, and this is the first time I've been in Acacia Woodland since I've been in the Mara, and there's a whole host of different species that we might encounter here, and the main reason, apart from an adventure, which I always love, is I've come here, is this is the chance we have to see a separate hyena species. So away from those open plains where you have massive spotted hyena clans, this area is home to the striped hyena. So fingers crossed on our adventures today, we might possibly, very slim chance, I'm just gonna say this, but it's worth the slim chance, find a striped hyena in this area. Now, as I said, I don't have any communication with Rebecca. That that's for final control. So I'm pretty sure they're tired, and you're all tired of me. I haven't heard from her. Oh, you haven't heard from her. Okay, then we can carry on until she tells me to keep quiet because I love talking, <laughs> as most people in our in, 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 at Wild Earth and Safari Live know. And um, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm, am I being told to link away because? You can link to Jenny. I'm not sure what she's but I was just getting started with my talking, Rebecca. But anyway, I'm sure Jamie's got something absolutely spectacular to show you. <laughs> I just, in that whole process, poor Brent doesn't have comms because he's out of the vehicle. And I don't know what I just did, but I just lost my comms with Rebecca. I was laughing so much, Rebecca, over the radio that I... I accidentally knocked the connection. Rebecca, can you test the comms? It's pouring with rain now. <laughs> oh dear. We... No, I've got nothing. I don't. I don't. Okay, good. Well, well, Ferg, Ferg can hear you, Bex. I'm desperately trying to cover everything up. I know this is very ill-timed because we've been waiting to, to show you these lovely cheetah and this lovely light, but the rain is now pouring in. So I'm going to have to shift us around and put one side down so that we can have, well, protect our equipment from all of the water, first of all, um, and so that secondly, I can try and figure out exactly what my comms problem is. I'm so sorry, Rebecca, it was, it was <laughs> a comedy of errors there. Why are you not working? You were working so well a moment ago. I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna unplug and replug. How's the camera doing there, Ferg? Are we getting a little, yeah, um, yeah. There's Rebecca. Okay. I've solved one problem, but I do need to put the rain covers down because it's splashing all over the monitor and my hat. Okay. Off we go to Taylor and we'll catch up with you in a little bit. Um, cool. <laughs> We're back. We're back with the lions. And it... Well, yes. They have just mated. That was very, very peaceful, which is unlike lions. So... I wonder how long they've been mating for, and I'm sure this is one of the triangle boys too. I mean, normally it's always so spectacular when lions mate in terms of the sounds that you 
that you hear. We normally sit so quietly so you can hear the growling. And there definitely was a little bit of growling. But they're looking tired. They're looking thin. So maybe this has actually been going on for quite some time. We'll be able to time it now. It's 6 o'clock. It was 5.59 when they first mated. And we'd been sitting here since quarter two. So we'd been sitting here for 14 minutes. So now we can sort of take it from there. Not that we've got somewhere to start from. It's always difficult when you arrive and you don't know how long these cats have been mating for. But it's just interesting, though, because we were here two mornings ago and there was an entire pride of lions around. So obviously they moved off and she, unfortunately, was not allowed to move. And these males would have kept a very, very close eye on her, as they typically do. Some buffalo also moving just in the background towards them. But he hasn't even stared across in that dis distance. I don't think he's interested at all. Neither does she. And we did find the other male, but we'll show you him a little bit later. He's hiding in a horrific spot down in the lug, and it's very, very difficult to see him at the moment. I wonder how far along she is. I mean, typically mating will last about five days or so, but her estrus cycle can last anywhere between four and seven days. She doesn't look like a particularly young girl either. She looks fairly mature. But I suppose from this angle, it is a bit difficult. And they're not very close to us either. They must be about 60, 70 meters away. So so not like we normally have lions when they're mating right on top of the car. You see, in the Mara, there are certain areas where we can't off-road. And this happens to be one of them. I haven't been able to find the sausage tree prides. So it's a bit of a problem to try and get lions up close. Now, a question that's asked quite regularly, and, and it's... Uh, from Riti, and it's about why do lions bite, or well, the male lions bite the back of the female's neck? It's because their penis is is barbed. Darby, how old are you? <laughs> Darby just burst out laughing. And every time he giggles, he makes me laugh as well. It's a problem. <laughs> so, yes, it's because uh, he does have a barbed penis, and, and you can imagine that extraction can be quite painful. So it, it's said that he tries to bite her neck to try and distract her from the pain. I can't confirm this, however. And um, I remember with all the sort of things we say about lions, of course, it's just theories. It's very difficult to know for absolute certain, unless you could ask a lion, why do you do that? Who taught you? Was it dad? Was it just natural instinct? Which is actually quite an, another good question. Is how do they learn, or how do they know that they have to bite the back of the neck of the female? Sometimes they don't do it, though. Like there, you could see he wasn't particularly interested. But when they are mating, and they can mate up to well over 250 times in their honeymoon period, most of those attempts wouldn't even be successful. So I suppose that's why they have to mate so often. And because... The amount of times I've witnessed males mounting females and, well, not exactly performing uh, too well. Well, I suppose then the females, if they're only mated once, would probably go, have to find a few different males that would be willing to mate with her. Once is not enough, unfortunately, for lions and leopards. Let's see. It's getting to the time now where they might get up and moving. And, and if they are coming towards their Easter cycle, and that male is definitely looking on the thin side, they could go off and hunt. They most certainly could do so. And there's definitely enough food around for them. Now, Mr. Denton, you're wondering why those buffalo back there are not afraid of those lions. I don't think that those buffalo know that the lions are there. But buffalo and lions are their enemies. You know, obviously lions absolutely love to catch them and to feast upon them. It's a big meal that can last them for a couple of days. So it's, it's the ideal prey for a lion. However, it is also one of the most dangerous things that they can go after. And buffalo kill lions on a regular basis, Mr. Denton. So um, I don't think they would be too worried either. If they did come a bit closer and maybe picked up the scent if the wind was blowing down towards them, they might point their noses towards the air and snort a little bit. And if there were... And if they come to the side of the lugger, they might even chase them away. And that's what I've seen most. I have yet to see lions successfully take down buffalo. I have seen the lions of the Mara on many buffalo kills. So it's not to say that they don't. But every other uh, opportunity I have had to watch them hunt them, uh, the tables have turned and the buffalo have chased away. Big prides of lions too, which is quite amazing. But imagine being the size of a lion. So average weight of a female... 
about 150 kilograms, a pretty big girl, and for a male, anywhere between 180 and about 210. I mean, there are those exceptions of big males getting even larger than that, but um, if we're just talking average here. And uh, the, uh, basically a predator of that size trying to take down something that weighs almost three times as much. So thank you so much for all your questions this afternoon. If you do want to ask any, you are more than welcome to have chats with us. Hashtag Safari Live, of course, and you can also chat to us via YouTube. Now, and now you're wondering, what is the typical gestation period for lions? It's very short. It's only about three and a half months. Can you believe that? 110 days. So you normally don't even notice that the females have got a little bulging belly. It can be mistaken for a belly filled with buffalo. Uh, right until the last few weeks and she'll normally move away from the pride as well she'll start looking for a den site preparing a spot where she will give birth and eventually she'll go off on her own where she will give birth and she'll spend the next two weeks or so looking after those youngsters and caring for them every single day that's a very very important part of a lion's life they're completely helpless because for the first 10 days or so uh, they, their eyes are shut so they really do rely on mom to move them around a bit. Obviously, they do wiggle about and, and move away here and there. Um, but mom will be close by, uh, well, hopefully. Now, I mean, I have seen cases where females have just, you know, abandoned cubs before, go off for a few days, hunting. Uh, you know, there's no point in going back to your cubs if you've got nothing to feed them. So it's a pretty tough life. But we'll sit here for a little bit because I'm timing. I want to figure out how far along these lions are in their honeymoon period. Brent, however, is staring across into the distance and looking at the plains of Tanzania. Well, actually, we're staring back to Kenya and we're with an animal that will not abandon their children for a few days. And it is, of course, the ostrich. We have a lovely flock of female ostriches. And every now and then you might see some buildings in the background. And that is the final frontier of Kenya. It is the Sand River Gate, the border between Kenya and the Serengeti. Now, the border itself does not lie at the gate. There's the gate. And uh, probably about a kilometer. There we go. That Sand River Gate there. If you like camping, you can go camp. There, that would be your ablutions right next to the sand river and you can camp right next to there and there's a buffalo and a water tank <laughs> so that is the sand river gate as I said we've been flirting with the edge of Tanzania and uh, halfway between that camp and a camp a little bit further to the the left where's it gone a little bit more a little bit more Seb okay. oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, there we go that is the Tanzanian Rangers station there we go. That is the Sand River Tanzanian Ranger Station. Now, it is a it is an incredible thing because the Kenyan and Tanzanian Rangers don't see the boundary. They operate anti poaching and rhino monitoring over both sides of the river because they understand that the animals don't see the international boundary like we do, and they will cross when they will. So the the rhino monitoring and the the conservation of the, the black rhinos in this area is run by both Kenya and Tanzania equally and when a rhino goes either side that if you are a rhino monitor and you are following uh, you can cross into Kenya or you can cross into Tanzania now almost in Tanzania but not quite in Tanzania just yet is one of my favorite antelopes now I have an absolute love for the Trafalegids or Trafaleg James as I say it wrong all the time. I'm still going to stick with Trafalegids, which is the spiral horned antelope. My favourite antelope in the world is a bushbuck, but quite close after them is the biggest of the family, and that is the eland. And we've got a, a really nice herd, and you can see how different as Seb zooms in towards the eland this area is. You've got lots of acacia trees and the short grasses, but look at that. Oh, there's a very frisky young male. Hopefully one of the big males doesn't see you, little man. You'll be in quite a lot of trouble. And you can see the dewlaps on the younger males, that one that's about to walk to the left of frame. There we go. You can see that dewlap, um, which is a, a sign of dominance in the males. And uh, still quite a young boy, that one. He hasn't developed into a, 
a hefty fellow just yet. And I, I have been trying to look for the dominant male of that herd, but I haven't had any luck yet. He might be beyond the ridge. He might be at Tanzania and Eland already. But that, that is one of the, the most amazing things about Africa is the diversity you get uh, in the different areas. I mean, this morning with the five boys, we were sitting on areas where there wasn't a tree in sight. It was open grassland. And now we're looking at this incredible acacia woodland that is filled with elands and ostriches. Not that the elands and ostriches won't go onto the open grasslands, but they just happen to be where we are at this moment. Now you can see that the vertical stripes on some of the eland, which is very distinct when it comes to the Traffalegids, if you think about them all, um, Kudu, Inyala, Bushbuck, Bongo, Sitatunga, all carry those stripes. And uh, eland are the only one that is not a Traffalegus when you say their Latin name. So an Inyala, for example, is a Traffalegus angazi. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted by Rebecca there for a second. So a spiral horned, I don't know, is a is a, is an Inyala. A spiral horned who has been drawn on is a bushbuck. In the Latin name, it is Traphelagus scriptus, um, which in Zulu, the name is Mbabala, the one who has been drawn on. Now, Eland are the only one that is not a Traphelagid. They are a Toro Tragus, Toro being bull because of their large size. Now, one thing I would really like to see, and I doubt that the musketeers might be able to take them down, but you never know. Maybe a baby would be in Eland. Let's see what Jamie's thoughts are on Cheetah versus Eland. Maybe, maybe a little Eland. I guess it's within the realms of possibility if it was quite young. Although I can somehow imagine the rest of the Eland fighting back, and I don't think that the Cheetah would be able to withstand that onslaught. Eland, of course, much larger than a wildebeest, although I really was quite amazed, or I have been, actually, during the, the amount of time that I've spent with these boys, at the sheer power of them. I confess to having underestimated exactly how powerful cheetah can be. The fact that in the hunts that I've witnessed, it's one cheetah that actually gets, grabs, and takes down, well, the initial takedown comes from one cheetah, I find quite extraordinary. Yes, the other five pile in and they help, but it's the, it's the one that, that actually makes the, the break for it and grabs the prey. I mean, you think of how heavy a wildebeest is compared to how heavy these cheetah are. It is quite a fantastic show of strength. It's a wonder they don't injure themselves more. I think it's just because I've never seen cheetah tackle such large prey ever. I, the... the one of the most dramatic hunts, cheetah hunts I've witnessed was an ostrich hunt. It really, they've been quite an education for us, I would say, in terms of behavior, although I believe them to be the exception rather than the rule. The evening is starting to fall here on the National Reserve, and we've survived the worst of the rain, with one side down, which is sheltering us beautifully from the wind now. And I think that's it. I think we've got... I don't know, I've said that about five times today, haven't I, Ferg? Mm -hmm. I think this is it. It's okay. We can roll the rain covers up. No, we can't. Let's roll them right back down again. <laughs> well, we sit in the muddy Mara... Um, off on uh, halfway up the continent. Let us send you back across to Tristan, who has done some very interesting tracking segments, and he's got another one for you. Must be the same one that we keep finding tracks for, man. Right, so we are live, and I was busy talking to VM, and I was trying to work out how we're going to find this animal. But what I've circled here is you'll see that there's a big circle, and then if you look slightly beyond the circle going away from me, you'll see that there's these lines in the sand. Now, I'm pretty sure that this is the same track that we keep finding for a very, very, very special creature, one that we really struggle to find out here, and that is the pangolin. Now, it looks like it's its tail drag that comes down the road. You can actually see it's quite difficult, but it's 
when I get close now, and in fact, I wish I had the bushwalk camera right now, but you can see fine little ridges of the scales, which I didn't notice before, being dragged along. And then in the circle where I've circled, if you have a look, you can see little kind of indentations. It's difficult to see. It's not easy, but there's little sort of markings there. So there's one, two, three, which are the claws of the pangolin, and then there's a back foot over here. So that's the little front kind of claws touching the ground, and then this area over here is the back foot, and here again, and they go all the way dotted along down into this thicket over here. We did walk around because there's also tracks for Tundi close by to try and see if I can find this pangolin under a bush somewhere, but alas, I haven't found anything. I want to try and just go around to the other side to Vulture's Nest. It's not far from where we are, and just check if these tracks come out on the other side. I drove here yesterday afternoon, and so there was nothing here yesterday afternoon, but this is probably from last night or the early hours of this morning. I don't think anyone drove here, but super exciting and something that we really don't see very often, but I'm pretty sure it's the same individual that we keep seeing. I think it's the same tracks that we keep seeing. I've seen this track now. This is the third time that I've seen this track, and it's all within this kind of Chelapan area, Mulawati area, and so it's just a matter of time until we find it, and I'm going to just double check on Weaver's Nest, I mean Vulture's Nest side, to have a little look, and then I want to try and just check in between under a couple of the bushes, and maybe, just maybe, we get lucky. It's a long shot and a shot in the dark, but a very, very cool one. Now, while I'm here, and while we just kind of parked off and we're talking about these pangolin tracks, I thought I would show you what I was pointing out, because it's very difficult to see anything actually in the sand itself. So this is the pangolin track that we're talking about. I was talking about the three lines, so there they are, and that's the front foot. And so it has these long, long claws, and sometimes those claws will touch and then just drag a little bit, and that's why you get these kind of three lines, and then this is the back foot. And this is an actual size of a pangolin track. This is as big as they get, so you can look if you use my finger as an example of how big their foot is. Not very large at all, and you get this kind of oval, strawberry-shaped sort of back pad, and then these tiny little toes. And if we look really closely at the track, there's a lot of those little toe markings as well along the edge, which is really cool. So something very, very special, and, and tiny these tracks I suppose are very special too but well I'm too excited to try and see if I can find a pangolin to worry about the Tundee's tracks just yet. I'll keep an eye out for them obviously but I want to try and see. Vildi what do you think about a first prize goal of Tundee with a pangolin? That's James, you're asking if I've ever found pangolin tracks before. I most certainly have. This is the third time I've found pangolin tracks in the last, I would say, month and a bit. So I've been really fortunate. I've seen a lot of pangolin tracks recently. And so, sorry, Rebecca, can you repeat that again? You just broke up a little bit and there was somebody on the radio talking as well. I didn't hear Rebecca very nicely. But... Scat, ah, sorry. So no, I haven't seen scat um, of this animal, but it's here it crosses again, and this is a lot more clear because I haven't walked all over them and looked, but there you go, there it's crossing the road, and you can see how the tail is going from side to side. So I'm going to attempt to track a pangolin, and maybe we're gonna get it right, maybe we're not, but worth a shot, but there it is where it's crossed the road and come out on this side. So I'm gonna keep following these tracks and just check. This could be quite fun and quite exciting. It's certainly something that I've never done before, and like I said, I've never seen it scat before. I don't know what its scat even would look like but I'm gonna try I'm gonna try and have a look and see if there's not a pangolin lying around somewhere here and I think the best way to do this is going to be probably on foot and so Rebecca is giving me a little lifeline and so while I try and negotiate this and see if I can find this pangolin let's go back across I actually didn't even hear who because I'm too excited right now and I'm a bit shaky because I want to find a pangolin and so hopefully it will be one of the girls I think it's one of the girls and hopefully it will be something interesting Good guess, Tristan. Hopefully, that was the right pick. <laughs> We're still sitting with our mating lions, and they did mate so quickly after 12 minutes. For those of you that have just joined us, welcome again. My name is Taylor, and David is bringing you this wonderful footage. And that, my friends, is Maurice, or Maurice, who is just taking it. <laughs> who is just as. Um, Comfortable, I suppose. You look how comfortable he's got his sunglasses on, though, Maurice. It's a little bit late. Obviously, been on the party and feels as though he needs to hide his eyes today. Unacceptable on a work day. And um, it's 6 o'clock in the evening here. Not good. Anyways, our lines are sitting up. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. So we've obviously got two males. And we know that when you have a coalition of males, 
that will find a female that's in estrus, one of the prides uh, they see too in the, within their territory. Uh, they'll fight for dominance, so they'll fight amongst one another and whoever is the biggest and the strongest at the time. And that could, you know, be because of a number of different things. Maybe one has had a good meal and the other didn't have quite a good meal, so he's slightly weaker already. Maybe there's an existing injury or, well, that one is just strongest on the day. And I think... Because this male, other male doesn't seem interested whatsoever in the female. I think that he has already been mating with her, and this fella has uh, jumped on board towards the end of this female's estrus cycle. So I think that's what's gone on over here. He's he looks pretty exhausted though, but he's thin. So I think this you know this added. Um, well, energy that he's having to use every couple of minutes is really taking it out on him. And whether he'll continue mating for another day or two, I'm not so sure. I mean, when, when she's finished with the Easter cycle, she's going to try and get out of there as quickly as possible. I've never seen lionesses run so fast from males before, especially new males. These boys, however, are well established within this area. I'm not actually sure how long they've been in rain for, but they definitely see a lot of girls, which is quite nice. And that's important for these boys. And it's also important that they don't get too weak, because if another group of young male lions hears all the commotion, you know, the growling from the mating, they could come on in. And these boys could be down and out and could potentially lose their reign. And youngsters could come in, in, come on in and take over. And there's no shortage of them at the moment. There are so many young coalitions out at the moment that we'd quite like to take on this particular area. We can see clearly how lush and wonderful it is filled with prey. Who wouldn't want a spot like this? But for now, the triangle boys are still going strong. Jamie has got a view of the sunset, which I don't. Let's go and see that beautiful spectacle. The sky doesn't even look real tonight. It actually really doesn't. It looks like something somebody's painted. It is, and I'm not. I'm, I'm not even going to. I'm not even really going to say too much. I'm just going to let you look. Take in the view for a second, and listen to the frogs. The winds died down. I'm, I'm on the same page as Rebecca. Rebecca just said she feel like it feels like she's just de-stressed, sitting here in silence with those sounds. Okay. Just when it's entirely up to our cameraman to tell the story, instead, as it should be, says Ferg. <laughs> Well, that was quite lovely, wasn't it? Right, and just a quick reintroduction for those of you that have just joined us. And now I've just realised I no longer need this, but anyway, it's one of those things. My name is Jamie. This afternoon, Fergus was responsible for bringing you those really lovely images. I hear he prepared that sunset specially for you this evening, so a big thank you to Fergus. Well done, Ferg. No worries at all. <laughs> It really is. It feels like a fantasy evening. After all that rain, with the five cheetah boys under a sunset that defies description. I really don't think it gets better than that. Ah. 
safari wild man, the question on everybody's mind, the white elephant in the room, and all those sorts of expressions. <coughs> Not an actual white elephant, by the way, um, which I suppose it could be a bit deceptive on a live safari. You want to know if the five boys will stay together for the rest of their lives? I think that is still a question that is up in the air. Personally, I think the fact that they're still together, um, probably with one of them having mated with a female, possibly with them having killed another male as part of a territorial dispute, I think they're going to stay together. But there are different, differing opinions on that, and quite a few people oppose that view, and they think that they're going to split into two and three, which would be the more natural or the, the more n normal number. The average number of male cheetah coalitions will usually have two or three members. Um, to see five like this is unusual. I personally think they're going to stay together, but I, I mean, let's wait and see. And of course, I mean, unfortunately, we've already spoken about the mortality rates of cheetah. Unfortunately, we say that they might stay together for the rest of their lives, and sadly, it's a, a fact of nature out here that that could be quite short for one or two of them. If they run into trouble, if they run into the wrong clump of bushes that happens to be hiding a lion, it does happen. I don't think they're going to struggle to come up against any other male cheetah. Although you never know, numbers aren't everything. Sometimes experience and age helps as well. I don't know. The biggest, I think the biggest split would, or chance of a split would come with a female in estrus. That is something that I would really like to, I would like to observe because I think it would be fascinating to see how these boys decide who gets a chance to mate with a female. Yes, Joanna, they would. They would fight with a female, absolutely. And they, would, they could potentially fight quite seriously. Now, typically, apparently, in cheetah coalitions, there's often one member that's more dominant than the others, kind of contrary to, to lion coalitions, where it's not that clear and it changes from day to day and month to month in terms of who's in better condition. And I imagine, actually, it would be quite similar for cheetah males as well. Who's, who's feeling the fittest. But yes, they absolutely would fight over the females. Okay, well, as the sun sets over to the west of us here in the Masai Mara, let's go across to Brent, who's sitting on the southern boundary, enjoying the sunset view himself. Enjoy, enjoying is the exact word. The sight from here is absolutely stunning. As Sebastian comes out, we can even see rain to the far west of us. And we've got these lovely little acacia trees. And you can see there's a funny little sign there. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what the sign says. Because Sebastian, for the first time in his life, very shortly, or well, about six minutes ago. By the way, Sebastian is my cameraman. My name is Brent Leo Smith. And you are on a live African safari. And... You are about as far south as you can get in Kenya because Sebastian just walked to the other side of the sign, which means he was in Tanzania. Naughty boy, Sebastian. <laughs> so there we go. Um, there we go. We are as far south as you can get. We are on the boundary, and there's a, there's a road that runs between Kenya and Tanzania that tourists are not allowed to actually partaken so only the rangers use it so there we go you are now entering the serengeti national park of tanzania and everyone out there a, a quick little language lesson for you there's no such place in the world is tanzania it does not exist it has never existed it shall never exist the correct pronunciation is tanzania so it is it is one of my pet peeves it's also can uh, it's also you live you, you you go to Kenya you don't go to Kenya it is Kenya and Tanzania not Kenya and Tanzania that is how the words are said so sorry rant over now uh, we've got to go through this valley off to the right of us here and just beyond this hill is the domain of the Black Rock Pride so I'm hopefully going to get there without too much fuss and uh, who knows will the cubs be around will they be out hunting uh, we're going to find out shortly. So while we make our way from the boundary of Tanzania, <laughs> we're going to go to Taylor. Well, unless she's lost, 
which is possible because she does get lost quite often. We're hoping she's still in Kenya. <laughs> no man, Rebecca. I was doing faces at the camera because Darby was testing. <laughs> Can I go home now, please? That was so embarrassing. Thank you for not saying anything. You're lucky. Ah, okay. Well, anyways, in case you had any doubt that this wasn't live, this is it's happening right now from Kenya. Tanzania is not too far away. It's just across uh, near where Brent is. <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm just saying that just to annoy Brent. Um, <laughs> Rebecca, what did you see me doing? Was I pulling faces and, and fluttering my eyelashes at the camera? That's so awkward. Why does this stuff always happen to me? Anyways, on lines. <laughs> Apparently, I was just doing my hair, says uh, Rebecca, who's directing today. Oh, so wonderful. Caught me in the act. Anyways, our lines are still resting. They haven't mated just yet, so we were on 12 minutes. Okay, we've jumped up a little bit now. We have... We have passed the 12-minute mark again. Maybe it's going to be 15 minutes before they mate. But I definitely think that's what's happened. Uh, and it, the light's fading very, very quickly this evening, obviously with all the cloud cover and, and from where we are. We unfortunately didn't get a sunset at all. The clouds, uh, not the clouds, the sun is right behind the escarpment, which is a bit of a pity because it would have been nice to have had some golden light on these two beautiful cats. We will probably leave them in the next minute or so i don't think we're going to stay here for too much longer they don't look like they're going to get up and do too much i mean that male's hot on this female's heels and i don't think he's going to let her out of out of his sight and it is an awkward spot and quite far away in the lugger so we will go and try and find the angamas Now, here's a question, right, from our beard. No playing around this afternoon. You wanted to know how often does a male get slapped around that it would draw blood? Well, their claws are super sharp, and, and of course, when they do swipe at one another, uh, those claws will end up connecting on the skin. Uh, so I'm sure it would draw blood as if you were to prick your finger. It might just be a, few, a little drop here and there. We might not be able to see because of their, their coats and their shaggy manes. Uh, every now and then, though, along the nose where it's quite sensitive, it's quite common to see lions with cut up noses and it's normally from the girls and then of course when big males are fighting amongst one another if they're living in coalitions um, or if it's a takeover you know then of course they're gonna have plenty of injuries but I don't know if I can give an exact you know sort of percentage of how how often it sort of happens I think it just depends on how hard they really get hit and if their claws come out uh, and all those different types of things. But you do you do see them around their face with a couple of scratches. I'm formal from the Birmingham boys in South Africa. Oh my goodness, he's forever got scars on his face. He he I don't think I've ever seen him with a clean face. Just after I started working at Wild Earth, he had that terrible bath with myasis with the um the flies getting in German laying eggs underneath a wound which he had uh, quite close to his eye. He was very lucky to recover from, from that because it was quite a nasty injury. But he, he managed to keep it clean. Okay, he's nodding off. He's doing classic mom head roll at the moment. And now a question from Anna. Uh, thank you. It's your second one for the day. Well, well for me anyway. So it's great to hear from you. Uh, you're wondering, would this mating pair hunt together? Most certainly. And you are a new viewer, and I congratulations. Well, I don't know why I'm saying congratulations, but welcome. That's great, and I look forward to getting to know you a little bit better. So don't be shy. Get in all those questions, as many as you can, and hopefully we'll teach you a thing or two, and maybe, if you're lucky, even make you laugh. So, yes, they will hunt together. Uh, if it's at the beginning stages of mating and, uh, you know, they're not particularly hungry, they'll probably give it a skip for the first day or two. Only later on might they go for something. And like I said, I think I think this is the end of it. I think this is just the, the other male um, sort of having a chance towards the end of her Easter cycle. She doesn't seem really bothered at all. I mean, she just rolls over and completely ignores him, completely uninterested. And typically in the beginning, she'd be a little bit on the excited side. You know, she might also be uh, nudging and rubbing heads with that male. Well, it seems as though yawns are contagious this afternoon, though. Now, let's see what happens here. You know, if they walk towards the other road, 
so a little bit south from where they are towards those buffalo that would be good because there is another road there and then we can carry on following them at the moment it's just a bit awkward we're in a spot where we're quite far away Okay, so while I ponder and decide on whether we're going to carry on or not, Tristan seems to be, I think he's bumbling about at the moment. He's the Leopard King. Will he find Shadow or will he find a pangolin? Well, earlier I was discussing about finding a thick-billed cuckoo and, and we got the challenge about finding a thick-billed cuckoo and I was saying we need to find Rhett's helmet tracks in order to find them. Now, we found our Rhett's helmet tracks, so these are Rhett's and they seem to be having a little nap. This is obviously where they're going to be roosting for the night. Look a bit dopey, don't they? And one almost seems as though it's sleeping on top of the other one, but they all huddle together and probably that will just keep them warm during the night. I wonder if they don't know that there is maybe potentially some fire weather on its way and that's why they're just hunkering down like this in a tight little group together to huddle for warmth but you can tell it's a red just by that red little eye ring and red beak and so where these guys are well thick pickled build cuckoos are never far away and so we'll have to just scratch around unfortunately no further luck with our pangolin tracks we tracked them into a really dense dense thick area and we just lost them from there I've tried to look around under all the bushes and thickets but really there's no way to tell where it goes from this hardened section that they we're in so I'm hoping that maybe at some point they decide to come out so we'll try them tomorrow morning and just double check there's a little water point here that maybe that pangolin goes to drink at because they do drink water and so maybe we'll just have a look there and maybe we get lucky so that's the pangolin tracking story I was super excited because I thought well these look quite fresh they were over the top of all the vehicle tracks and so I was excited if somebody had driven there this morning but alas nobody drove there this morning so it's on top of last night's track so that pangolin theoretically could be in a termite mound or or something like that. Kristen, you're asking if pangolin are territorial. In all honesty, I, I, as far as I know, they are. I'm, I don't know that much about them, and there's really so little written about them that it's very difficult to find information and find out exactly what the story is with pangolins and whether or not they are. But I would imagine that they are. If I look at the, the pangolin that is being seen extensively on elephant plains and Simambili, I mean, that there's two pangolins apparently, two different ones, and they're being seen on average apparently every sort of week. And so, and in the same place, they keep finding them in the exact same areas. And so, I'm thinking that yes, they are territorial. And I don't know whether males will track for females, or females look for males, or how it works. But that's what I've heard is that they are in the same place, and that they will kind of spend time to, you know, in the same area, and hopefully then find a mate from there. But interesting animals, and, and like I say, so little has actually been written about them. You, you can try and even look for information, and it's tough to find a lot of research. The only person that I know that is pretty much an authority on pangolins is a guy by the name of Jonathan Swart and Jonathan Swart was a, a I'm not sure how to put it but probably a, a lot braver individual than many others and in, in that Jonathan used to go out in the middle of the night armed with a torch and a backpack and a handgun in his backpack and he used to follow pangolins through the Sabi sands at night on his own and so what he would do is he would find them and then follow them around in the middle of the night with a little spotlight and that's it uh, which is, if you've heard us talking, we'll know that that's incredibly dangerous to be out at night. But he did it, and he did it for some years. And he managed to study pangolins and follow their movements and work a lot of stuff out. And he's a bit of an authority on it. And there's a few papers that he's written, and he's a very knowledgeable guy on, on pangolins themselves. So maybe I'll have to just ask him and give him a shout and see if maybe we can get some more information from him as to the habits of pangolins and what exactly they do. So, Paul, the pangolin population, yeah, I suppose it is. I mean, it's, it's the most trafficked animal in the world, and so their numbers most definitely are being absolutely decimated. I, what baffles me is how they find them. I mean, we drive around here every single day, six hours a day. We, we look, we go everywhere. There's a scrub here, actually, talking about nocturnal animals. But we look everywhere, and we very seldom see them. In fact, I mean, we've only, I think, shown one live on Safari Live. And so they can't be as common as, we th as, as you know, they might, might have been at one stage. But they certainly it must be a population. If, if people are trafficking them and finding them, there must be at least some decent population. Um, at the end of the day, look, look at that that's pretty cool to have such a close-up look how large the eye is 
of that hair. But at the end of the day, their numbers are decreasing. There's certainly a, th a situation where they're not increasing. They, there's far too many of them being killed to be able to survive and to um, proliferate and, and be increasing. There's pretty much a situation where they are decreasing. I think that's got to be the closest I've ever been to a scrub hair to know its detail as much as that. Well done, Vildi. You can see the little white tail at the bottom, and there it's having a little snack. Now, these guys are quite interesting. Is when they are struggling to find nice green shoots like this one is, which is very relaxed right next to the car, they what they will do is they will defecate and they will re-eat their own feces. And they do that because in the winter months there's not much grass around and what they do eat lacks a lot of nutrition and so they have to absorb as much as possible. And what they do then is just eat what they've defecated and it's much like a ruminating animal, so like an impala or a giraffe or kudu, except it comes out before they put it back in their mouth. It doesn't just get regurgitated from there. So it's a pretty interesting way to go about things and don't you love how they eat with that little nose going back and forth and they are super cute little animals and it's very fluffy and very very pretty they're so well camouflaged when these guys lie in these thickets it is so difficult to see them yes hello we're talking about you it's amazing this guy is so relaxed or girl i'm not sure which one it's been a long time since i've been this close to a scrub here at this time of the day at night is one thing because they generally get a bit startled by the spotlights but and feel a little bit more comfortable at night but in the day you normally find them kind of scampering off and to be able to get this close and you're going to come closer oh, hello seems as well we've made ourselves a little scrub here friend now that scrub here i would say from our vehicle is no more than maybe i would say two meters there we go you can see where the vehicle is and where the scrub is and that is exceptionally close for a scrub here that is probably the closest like i say i've ever been to an adult scrub here little baby scrub bears you can actually get very close to because they just sit and freeze and that's their natural instinct so that they don't get preyed upon they back their camouflage rather than their ability to move but this adult is really coming super close like i say i don't know if i've ever seen a full eye shot of a scrub here since i've been here most certainly there wasn't so pretty interesting at least to see there's a little white tail so that will be able to be visible for the little ones if they're following the adults around or if there's a male or a female together that they can then see one another that they have that nice white bright tail and you see actually how it sort of tucks in and then there are those feet that leave those little kind of circular shapes in the sand and you can see why they leave a puffy track is because look at how much hair is around the pad there so all that hair will actually disturb the track itself and it leaves like a sort of puffy kind of non-defined track it's not like what we see with the cat paws or the hyena paws or the antelope hard hoofs because of the amount of fur on their toes and it just kind of makes a big smush and smudge and that's why scrub hair tracks are actually quite difficult to see the definition in them that's super cool awesome Chandler, I like your name. I was actually, funnily enough, watched a Friends episode the other day, and so your name reminds me of that. But you want to know if these scrub hairs box like brown hairs do? No, I've never seen them box. I would imagine that they must have a way of settling their disputes, but I've never seen them boxing. Um, it, it's, I don't know of anybody who's seen it. I don't know of anybody who's actually watched scrub hairs fight territorially, but I certainly have never seen them boxing in any way, shape, or form, and so I don't think that they do. I mean, we see scrub hairs as much as probably any other animal out here at night. You, on your way home, it's pretty much every night you'll see a scrub hair, and I've never seen them boxing in any way, shape, or form. So I don't think that they do. Right. Well, I think what I'm going to carry on doing now is just drive the Mulawati and hope maybe this pangolin track appears again somewhere here. Maybe Tundi's tracks come out again because her tracks were pretty much on the same sort of path as the pangolin tracks. And they kind of scent marked a tree. You could smell the scent mark there. But there's no real sign of her coming out. At first, I thought it might be the tracks from when we found her the other day. But I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I don't know. It is, I didn't drive there this morning so or yesterday afternoon and so I'm not really sure if she was there yesterday afternoon or today or what the story is but there's doesn't look as though they're that fresh right now while I try and find either one of these elusive animals because both of them are being elusive I believe Jamie who hasn't struggled to find her animal this afternoon although they've decided that it's time for a very very large nap They do, in seem to be, they do indeed seem to be having a very large nap and we have switched to infrared because the sun has set 
and it is now I can see them still with my own eyes but it is getting very very dark now, I suspect that these chaps are going to be somewhere in this vicinity tomorrow morning so we're probably going to catch up with them then and what I'm going to do in the not too distant future is move back to those lionesses because after their stolen meal they seem to be very happy and they haven't stopped talking while we've been sitting here they're roaring every couple of minutes so we'll spend a little bit more quality time with the cheetah boys and then I think we're going to make our way across there. They're roaring like the frogs are. They're roaring like the frogs are. The frogs are very noisy at the moment. They really are. They're making so much noise. They're actually almost over overpowering the lions. I know that Tristan has asked whether any of us have ever seen a hair box. I haven't. I've never seen a scrub hair box. I don't no, I definitely haven't. I've seen photos of hares boxing, but not scrub hares. I've seen these boys box though. They seem to do it on an almost, I don't know, half hourly basis. As soon as they start to move, one of them gets too close to the other and they jump and they start <laughs> it's cheetah cheetah are odd when they fight. And even though I know that it can be quite serious and I know that it can be potentially deadly in certain cases, it's still the sounds that they make are just not quite as intimidating as a lion fight. Brent had that extraordinary lion fight this morning, and I haven't seen any sign of those lions today, and we weren't far from where they were. But that, you know, that the sound effects of the growling and then the roaring afterwards, and cheetahs sort of squeak and squawk. It's difficult to take them seriously when they do that. Umka, we, we're probably looking at the largest stable known population, uh, coalition of male cheetah in Africa. I have heard stories of coalitions of up to eight. I think, though, that it was probably a coalition that then split. It was probably a young coalition. In this particular case, the one that I read about was they were cousins not brothers because of course eight eight brothers would be impossible uh, and these boys are probably cousins as well but that is i've heard stories of that i've never seen it and i think that this is probably um, i'm not saying for absolute certain but i think this is probably the largest known male cheetah coalition in africa i haven't heard of any others elsewhere please feel free to correct me if i'm wrong those of you listening perhaps i have missed something somewhere which is entirely possible africa's quite big it's entirely possible I've missed out on news of a bigger cheetah coalition. This is certainly the largest coalition that I've ever encountered. I've seen many groups of two or three. I've never seen five altogether. And this will probably be the largest coalition documented in terms of people actually essentially following them every single day. Ourselves and other guides, photographs on social media, of course, the Mara Cheetah Project as well, monitoring them. And I think they'll probably be the most researched Cheetah Coalition. Okay, we're going to leave our sleepy cheetahs and go off in search of vocal lions. In the meantime, Taylor's got a beautiful sight as the lioness beelines straight towards her. That's exactly what's going on, Jamie. It's almost like somebody told you. But we do. We have a lioness coming straight towards us, which is pretty cool. I'm just going to dim my light. Uh, it's not just one of them. There are a couple. And before we even spotted these girls along the lugger, maybe about four, 500 meters away from the mating pair, uh, we did find some young lion cubs, too, hiding in the tree line. But they're quite young. Uh, so I didn't want to put any spotlights on them at all. But she's looking back. So, like I said, there is another line there. Let me see if I can spot her. There she comes. You can just start to see her when I put my light on her. Now, I'm not worried about, of course, putting the spotlight on an adult lioness. And they're not hunting at the moment. I think we might see them playing, in fact. She looks very curious, but they also look very, very thin. And we've seen a couple of buffalo scattered in and out the open areas. And just to my right, which we will go back and show you, because I, I suspect that that's the direction that these lions are walking in. There must be a herd of about 50 or 60 buffalo walking right past the car. Hello, girl. And, of course, we are in black and white now, in case you 
don't know what's going on. We are in infrared, so I'm not using my spotlight at all now. It's almost completely dark. We're just using the infrared light, so that's why it's coming across this bizarre color. And you're having a drink of water. You know, lions will drink whenever they can if they pass a puddle in the road, which is exactly what's happened here. Probably a little wallow that's filled up. They will have a drink. Normally, after a big meal, first thing in the morning, just before the sun goes down. And maybe they're not even going to go and hunt just yet. Maybe they're going to go back to those youngsters. This female, though, looks like she might be the mother of the cubs. I didn't see any suckle marks on the lioness that just walked past us. I also can't tell you the age of the cubs just yet because they were so far away and I didn't want to put the light on them. But you can see that her mammary glands are quite swollen. She sways from side to side. But she's going to walk pretty much ex the same route. We'll see if she's just as relaxed as the other girl that's just passed us. Not all lines have to be calm and, um, you know, easy around the cars. Some are a little bit on the nervous side. I find when you head towards Tanzania to that border, they seem to be a little bit skittish. This one, though, not worried whatsoever. And they've got a l huge area to walk around. I mean, they've got a massive open plain on the right of me to go around if they want to do, but they're quite happy to uh, choose the narrow route. Just shows you. Okay, let's turn around. Now I'm going to try and do this without driving off the edge of a lion. I might be naughty. I might go a little bit off. Cool. Let's follow these lions. So what do you think? Darby, you think they're going to go straight back to the cubs or do you think they're going to head to the beefalo? They're going to hunt. Darby says they're going to hunt. I think, I think they might pop past the cubs. We'll see. We can't see the buffalo now. They're a bit too far away. And I'm actually not going to put my spotlight on at all right now. Because if those buffalo do look towards me, they might see me illuminating them. So we'll just drive in the dark. Oh, there's, there's some big storms brewing in the distance. You might be able to, every now and then, see the sky light up. Lots of lightning. But still quite far away, so we should be safe for now. Hope that we make it home. And of course, well, as the sun sets, it wouldn't be an afternoon without flying insects, would it? Let's just hope they keep away from me and all the alates have been released because I don't know if I can take them crawling up my shorts anymore. Okay, so the cubs, I think they might go to the cubs first. I think they're going to go and greet the little ones or as soon as the young cubs realize that the adults are walking past because they had their heads peeping up, I think they're going to come running on out here. Let me go around. just want to make sure I don't drive any holes, so I'll just put the spotlight instead of using my headlights. Wait. Bumping, sorry everyone, on the car. And go around like this. It'll be quite cute. It might be a very nice little uh, interaction that we could see this evening. Okay, so they're just in front of the car now. No. Ham again, who is a new viewer, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Great, you're wondering why we're not scared. There's no need to be scared, not even a little bit. And these animals are not interested in us. I'm not trying to get their attention and they're habituated to the vehicles. You can just see, yes, yeah, there, the little heads poking out now. I'll put it on that adult. The other girl's walking around. So, you know, there's no need to worry. Obviously, it's very intimidating having a lion walk past your car for the first time. But I've been so fortunate enough to experience it time and time again. You can see one little cub just poking its head out in the tree line there uh, that it doesn't bother me at all. And so it is the, the lion that I was telling you about that looked like she had the suckle marks that's heading back there. So it must be hers. Let's just, we'll just get a better angle here quickly. We should be able to see them. I think they're going to come. Yes, they're running towards her now. Just to the... Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to take the light off them. I just used it just to show Darby what, uh, where exactly they'd gone. Because like now it's getting really dark. And they're quite far away on the tree line. How many she got? One, two, three, four. Leading them back into the tree line. They don't look very old. Maybe two or three months old. Maybe a little bit older than that. Maybe four months or so. But going straight down into the lugger, and the frogs are starting to chirp now. This female on the left actually looks a little bit disappointed that she's gone that way. 
I think that's exactly what she wanted. I think she wanted to head towards the buffalo. They're looking a bit on the lean side, but we'll try and keep an eye out on these girls and see exactly where they go. Hopefully they come back out and reunite and start chasing the buffalo around. Tristan, it's getting about that time. The leopard is going to pop out. Well, we're going to try and see if we can find our two male lions. We're just coming towards Chitwood Dam, but I can't actually see them. They apparently are here somewhere. They were left alone and no one with them, but I don't see any lions where we left them this morning, so I'll just have to try and have a look around. But in the meantime, we might as well just continue our pangolin discussion since we were talking about them just now. So I thought, well, I know a lot of you are asking what is a pangolin and what does it look like? So we've got ourselves a picture here and hopefully you'll be able to see it quite nicely. But there we go, that is what a pangolin looks like. It is a scaly, basically, animal that moves around or mammal that moves around pretty much at night more than anything else it's got these hardened keratin kind of scales that protect its body and it's got these long claws at the the front of its on its front feet that it digs with and exposes termites and ants and various other things and then this long elongated face with a long tongue that comes out and the tongue can be over 30 centimeters long it's absolutely massive and you'll see their back legs are also scaled and armor plated so that when they curl in a ball even their legs don't get attacked now sorry that was my phone that is just gone off but there we go that is what a pangolin looks like now francis from israel you're asking is a pangolin an armadillo so no a pangolin is not an armadillo it is a different animal altogether an armadillo has a fairly soft shell in comparison to what the pangolin does the pangolin if you had to tap on it it is incredibly hard it is basically like imagine your fingernails that has been put fingernail on top of fingernail on top of fingernail on top of fingernail to make a very thick almost sort of crust that's gone over the top of this pangolin and it is incredibly hard and they even I've seen lion I've seen leopard with their claws on it trying to bite on it and they can't get through those armor plated scales so it is incredibly hard it's not like an armadillo if a lioness get holding an armadillo it would probably chew through that very quickly and would be able to kill that little animal now I'm gonna just Anna Marie, you're asking if pangolins are precocial at birth. Now, I'm not 100% sure. With the, from what I've seen and what I've read about baby pangolins and, and how things work, is they are born and they're pretty much able to move around straight away. So they're able to kind of slowly move around. But what they do is they actually climb on their mom's back. And so mom just gives them a ride around and keeps them safe by putting them on her back. And as soon as there's a predator, then they both just curl up into a ball and then they try and kind of stay out of the way. So it seems seems as though they are pretty mobile straight away. I've just never seen a brand new born pangolin. In fact, I've never seen a baby pangolin. So I wouldn't really know how kind of developed they are at birth. I don't know if anybody ever has seen a brand new pangolin. All I know for sure is that if you get to see a baby pangolin riding on the back of a mother, well, I'll be the most jealous person in the world. And I know people that have seen it. It is just the most cool, epic thing. You get this little pangolin just riding on the back like it's surfing mom. It's super, super cool. So that's all I know about them. I don't act... I, like like I said, there's so little written about them and so little that has been actually published. It's tough to know all of these little things and, and to know a lot about a pangolin itself. I've tried to read a lot about them and tried to kind of study up, but really little going on. Hmm. Now, I'm going to try and check around for these lions. They seem to have just dis disappeared. I would imagine that they're somewhere in this general vicinity. And so while I try and track them down, let's go back across to Jamie and find out if she's ever seen a baby pangolin. seen a baby pangolin funnily enough I, I don't know many people who have in fact I'm trying to think if I know any people who have the, the list is is not long I imagine in the entire world of people who have ever seen a baby pangolin I know I'd be very happy if I saw a baby pangolin and I know it would be extraordinary to see one riding on mom's back in the way that they do but no I have never ever seen a baby pangolin so my plan failed, I'm afraid to say. My idea of going to go and see the lions was great in theory, but in practice, it, that crossing to get across that lugger that we did earlier just looked a little bit iffy to me at night. And being out at night means that nobody will come and save me. 
Maybe Brent if we ask him nicely, but he'll laugh at me, so I'm not taking that chance. But what we're doing is we're going home the nice way. Ish. Nice-ish way. Still going to slip and slide. Okay, well we slip slide our way back towards... Bex, the radio's doing it again. Just so you know. I'm getting your link to Taylor. Okay, let's try that again. While I slip side through the mud. Hold on, not yet. Ah, I think we've discovered an innate problem here. Our radios are playing up. While we slip slide, she says for the third time, third time lucky, let's go across to Taylor who's got some very cute little lion cubs. Had. Unfortunately, the lions literally ditched us, as Darby said. It was very funny. It was very punny because they went down into a drainage line. And unfortunately, the way that they're walking, the drainage line bends around. It sort of does a big serpentine, but it, to a spot that we can't get to. It could take them five minutes. It could take them two hours to navigate through that entire section. Uh, so we're going to move off and see if we can pick up on anything else. It's also just because we can't off-road here, which is a real problem. Uh, in terms of following the big cats, that's the only real problem. It's quite nice, actually, because at least you know that you are conserving the land around you. Uh, so, yeah, but it was nice to see them. They look very hungry. Maybe they're going to hunt a little bit later once they get a bit settled, once it gets a bit darker. And uh, quite exciting. We can come check around this area tomorrow and see if we can find the lions maybe on a kill. But it's, it's just going to be very tough with the very, very thick terrain. Sorry, I'm concentrating. These roads are around here are not so great. I think some very heavy vehicles have come through and obviously this is not a well-used road. They might have got stuck at one point and spun their wheels and, and dug lots of these little trenches which are not um, particularly comfortable to go through. You can lose a person if you hit them too hard. And also I'm driving on the edge of a lugger. I don't want to drive into it. That wouldn't be good now, would it? But along the lugger we could find many different things. We could find things like genets that have been living up in the trees. We could find hippos coming out of the luggers that are soaked with water. I don't know where the road is anymore. I think it's over here. Let me jump back on that. We could see bush, maybe bush baby, maybe. What else, David? What would you like to see? A serval, leopard laying on the banks up in a tree? What did you say, Darby? Porcupine? I've only seen one porcupine since I've been here, and that was then chased by an angama lioness. And that's the only one I've seen. You see the tracks everywhere in their diggings? We could definitely see some of those, aren't you? We'll keep looking. Wonderful. Well, it seems as though Tristan's luck has changed again. He's managed to find himself a big lion, I'm sure. It's a Birmingham. Our luck has changed because there lies Tinio and his head is up, not like this morning, so he's awake and he's looking around and he's looking because his brother Mfumo is behind us and sitting right out in the open and there's an impala that is busy snorting at Mfumo and so that's why Tinio is looking in that direction. But it looks as though maybe we're going to see a situation where these boys are going to start waking up and start moving. Are you... what's wrong? He keeps moving his whiskers as though something's just irritating his whisker area and giving him a little bit of kind of a uncomfortable experience. Maybe it's some of the flies that are going up towards the gum lines. You do find flies often doing it. They try and kind of get into those gum areas in order to sequest moisture from the mouth. Often when lions have been awake like this and they've been panting and their mouths are open, so saliva develops and you get a situation where there's a lot of moisture. So maybe that's why he's just kind of growling a little bit every now and then. I would imagine him Fumo is still sitting on the road itself because the Impala is moving away now. It's not standing upright and actually shouting anymore. Oh, look at that big yawn.
Kristen, yes, the males' manes will get darker when they have more testosterone flowing as they become dominant individuals, but there is still a genetic kind of part to it. So if you look at Tinho, he's got a lot of kind of darkness around his chest and then going over his head and over the top, whereas if we go to Fumo, Tinho is going to go to where Mfumo is. He's yawning, which is generally a good sign that he's going to start waking up. Hopefully, if Tinho goes there, you'll see that Mfumo's mane is a little bit more kind of blonde in coloration. And so there is a lot of genetics involved in it. But yes, as they get older and more dominant, so there's this kind of spike in testosterone, which causes a release of melanin, the dark pigments within the air. So are you in trouble for us? He lets out a little groan. Come on, roar for it. No, grooming time first. But maybe if we're lucky and we just spend a bit of time here, we might get a little roar from them. But what you can hear is how rough that tongue is. Now we're close enough just to hear the roughness kind of going through the coat. Isn't that cool? So you know that you are in close proximity to a male line when you can hear that. And so basically that's acting just like a comb and he's basically just grooming through his fur making sure he's getting rid of any of those little parasites that we would have picked up. There we go. Contact call. So he's trying, I think, to contact Mfumo, and he does it because he can't see Mfumo from where he is. Mfumo's not far, but that little call first. Mm. Now it's getting a little louder. Mm. And it will get louder and louder until one of them responds. So. Mm. Shame, boy, is no one talking to you? See how he stops and listens afterwards. Now this is my favorite sound in the whole world. If these guys start to roar, it is the best sound that you can ever experience in the bush. Now these are just little contact calls, but the, the more that he doesn't get an answer, the louder it will get and the more it will go up, and eventually we should hear a full-blooded roar. He looks a bit dopey, doesn't he, when his mouth is open? <laughs> There's nothing coming out. You can't not... <laughs> so he's opening his mouth at the moment and no sound is coming out, so we need him to actually <laughs> do a bit of a better effort. But he's go still yawning, so I I'm sure he's going to get up and move. I don't think he's going to be down for too much longer. The problem is, is we're not far from the boundary now, so what we've got to hope is that if they are going to roar and, and that they're gonna, there's going to be a response from the other brother that's with the sticks, is that they move more towards where those that brother and the sticks are because that's more towards Cheetah Plains, which should take them straight through Chitwa and be a lot easier for us to follow them. No, still not going to give us a full-blooded roar. Riti, you're wondering why the skin color of the Mara lions and those here at Juma are different? Well, it's probably a genetic thing. It's an evolution process that takes place, and the colors of each sort of lion will help them. I'm just going to keep quiet if he's roaring.
awesome was that? That is as good as it gets. We were absolutely spoiled because he let it out and Mfumo joined in from behind us. That is just the coolest thing in the whole world. So absolutely awesome. <laughs> and then I love how he just flop, flops down afterwards. Absolutely cool. Phoebe asking how many lions I can, th well, I think can hear him. Well, if I think about what the lions that are around us at the moment, so the Styx females, all three of them, their cubs, um, one of the other Birmingham males we know is close by as well, so he would have heard that. Um, probably a little bit out of range for the Inkuuma pride, although maybe they might have picked it up. Their hearing is better than ours after all, but I think they're just a little bit out of range. And who knows what male lions are sitting just south of the boundary near Mala Mala because we're not far from there either. So I would imagine maybe one or two of those lions on that side might have heard them so in total you could be looking at maybe 30 40 lions that could have heard him if all of the prides that I've just mentioned did um, and and potentially that's how many lions but ones that I know for sure that have heard him would be the three sticks adult females the four newest cubs and then the six other cubs that they've got so the 13 of them and 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 then obviously the fourth or third Birmingham. Right, so while, while Tinio sleeps, we're going to reposition towards Mfumo, and hopefully when we kind of get there, he, they'll start to roar again. And while we do that, I believe Brent is sitting with lions as well, and I think that completes a complete lion sort of domination between all of our feeds this afternoon, which is absolutely amazing. Three females from the Black Rock Pied trying to dig out a warthog, and there's a reason I'm not in infrared, um, it is, as we do with lions, most of the time we don't need infrared on, on the lions. And the fact that they are, are digging up a hole, um, we're not blinding any animals, we're not affecting their behavior. And of course, lions are, are, are incredibly capable of dealing with lights. It actually helps them at night. So they are busy digging out, or trying to dig out a warthog. Now, after the rain we've had, this is the sand's a lot softer. So they look how deep she's going in the hole. Look at that! Look <laughs> at that! Just her bottom showing. There might be piglets in there. Now these are the three mothers from the Black Rock Pride. Now, of course, warthogs have multiple bolt holes. So there's actually females on. If we go over to the right, there, Seb, on another hole as well. Oh, my hat's in the way. You can see they're digging in. Now, guys, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to, I'm going to have to move the car um, quickly so I can make sure I have comms with uh, final control. Which all it means is I'm, going to, I'm not going to disturb the lions. Um, I got a bit of breakup from Rebecca saying she's going to stick with us. Um, I'm just going to get a little bit higher on the hill so I guarantee we've got comms with Rebecca. While the, while the lions are trying to... Um, dig out this warthog. Now there could be piglets in there, so be warned if they do they are successful It could be very very graphic for sensitive viewers Okay, Becca, can you try to talk to me? I just want to test my comms in this area to know whether I should stop or not Okay, I can hear Rebecca I, and it is it is quite broken, but I can still hear her enough um, to survive and you can see they've, they've dug quite a lot already. So I think what happened is the lions... What, what I think happened is that the lions were sitting with the cubs and, and, and they watched the warthogs go down this hole. And uh, now that they have seen them go down the hole, and especially after the rain, they're now trying to dig. Now, Rebecca uh, would like to do an action broadcast. So, yes, Rebecca... Um, what I will do is ask, once we've started the action broadcast, ask Seb to turn off the present light. Not yet, because otherwise I'm going to be covered in fruit chafers. <laughs> so, Rebecca, when you are ready. Welcome to everyone. We are with the Black Rock Pied, the three females that have nine cubs, and they are busy trying to dig a warthog out of a hole. 
and you will notice that I'm using a spotlight, a white light, and there's a very important reason I'm doing that, is lines are able to deal with the light, so we're not affecting the situation that's happening. So that's the reason I'm using white light, so we can see a bit more. So normally we'd use infrared light if they were stalking up to something, but we have the white light on now, because obviously the warthogs are under the ground, the lines are not affected at all by the light. By the way, I forgot, my name is Brent Sebastian as a camera, and we're live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Now what I am going to do is ask Sebastian to focus in on the lines. I'm also going to ask him to turn off the light that, um, once we're on, on the lines, that, that is on me, because after the rain, we are... Oh, there we go! There we go! Something happened! Oh! Now, that amount of dust that just, just shot out there, it... It's an artifact. It's not... It, it's actually an artifact. It's not... It's not a warthog they're after. They're after one of the most seldom seen animals in Africa. It's an artifact. You can actually hear it beating its tail and digging. I might be wrong. But it sounds to me like there could be an art fark down there. And the lions are getting very close to get that reaction. Now, if they go down the hole again, you'll actually notice that that earth spews out. Something is digging, trying to dig down away from the lions at an absolute rate of knots. Well, I suppose you can't do a rate of knots underground. There we go. Let's see what happens. There we go. It is a warthog. Oh! Hold on. They've just got it. Now, sensitive viewers. The screaming is quite bad. It's a big male warthog. The female is now going for the, the throat grip. There we go. She's now got the got the throat now she the reason one of the reasons the predators go for that throat i know the sound is really disturbing is 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 to tr try shut down that screaming so it doesn't attract unwanted lions or hyenas i know for sensitive viewers this is this is very difficult and and a warthog screams are are very 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 hard to listen to but fortunately it seems like the lioness has got hold of the esophagus and she is going to suffocate it now and those those terrible signs will stop so i think we arrived at the most opportune time the lions had been digging for at least an hour to get that deep and the only reason they're digging into there is because of the rain normally the sand would be too hard but we had massive thunder showers today now this is quite gruesome the lions are starting to feed on the warthog while it is still alive oops sorry sorry i got a bug in my hair i'm just going to move the car quickly um so do apologies sensitive viewers please look away go grab a cup of tea um, this is very gruesome. The animal is still alive. The lions are, st are starting to feed on it. But this is Africa. This is nature at its most raw. And we are just witnessing something that would happen even if we, are, we were not here. Now, those screams might attract the male lions to the situation. Okay, thankfully, it, unfortunately, oh, sorry, I thought the warthog was dead. It is not dead. But you must realize this animal is in such a state of shock that it's probably not feeling anything. Obviously, it is still screaming in distress, but it is in such a state of shock. The lionesses at the back are already into its stomach. They've probably already eaten its kidneys and its liver, which are high-nutrient uh, items full of iron. Here we go. I think it's, it's not long. As I said, for sensitive viewers, this is very difficult. I do apologize. But this is what happens out here on a daily basis in Africa. Now, these three females have nine little cubs that they have to feed and have to produce milk for. So this warthog will be 
an incredible source of nutrients for them to be able to, to feed their little cubs. So we do have a few questions. Sorry, I, I just didn't catch them there. Rebecca, can you go again? Esther would like to know, would they bite the throat in order for it not to suffer? Esther, unfortunately, lions do not have thoughts like that. They are instinctive beings. They bite the throat to stop the scream, not for suffering, but to stop, stop it attracting other predators, hyenas, uh, possibly nomadic male lions, or even their same coalition of male lions, because these lionesses, and you can see they're really tucking in, they're eating as fast as possible, because if the males heard that in this area, they'll come and take the kill from the females. Now again, this is not for sensitive viewers. This is live from Kenya. This is live from the African bush. And this is lions, what they've been doing for the last 500,000 years. The animal is dead. It is not suffering anymore. Um, and I don't think it's been suffering for quite some time due to the fact that it's been in shock. And there we go. So there's one female still holding on to the throat. I think the animal is dead. She's just making doubly sure it's dead. Now, a big male warthog like this is a very dangerous animal for, for lions. They have incredibly sharp teeth. Um, their tusks, their bottom tusks, known as tushes, are as sharp as razor blades. So they are able to actually inflict incredible damage to lions. So they have to be very careful when... Oh, lioness is looking up, and I said that screaming might attract male lions. Let me just have a quick look with the spotlights around. So, so far, luckily for the girls, no sign of male lions. Now, a side would like to know, is it true, is, is their bite force proportional to the size of prey? I would say to a degree, Hassad, and also the bite force depends on, on the fight that is given by the prey. So with prey that fights more, such as a buffalo or a warthog, uh, they will generally bite a lot harder. Now, those legs kicking is not the animal alive. That is just its nerves kicking through. Um, and so, so when something fights more, the bite force will be more um, than something like small, like an Impala or a Thompson's Gazelle, that with one bite you've crushed the spinal column. But with something as big as a warthog, now a big male warthog can weigh nearly as much as a lioness, up to about 110 kilograms. A lioness only weighs between 120 and 130. And with those sharp teeth, it is a very, very dangerous prospect for these girls. But they have succeeded here. And it has taken a lot of hard work. Now, some of you are wondering whether we've interfered in the situation. Those lions were digging in that hole when we arrived. And we have just watched what they were doing already. Birda was, or Gerda was wondering why was the one not eating. She was making sure it was dead. She's now 100% sure it's dead. And she is now licking and she's about to start feeding. There we go. As she goes. Now, a, lion, a lion's tongue is like really, really rough sandpaper. If it had to lick your arm, it would actually take the skin off. So what she was doing, and she's doing it again just in case. Uh, because a warthog is such a dangerous animal, she's trying to make sure that it is absolutely dead before she starts feeding. Now, as I said, it's quite a good meal for lions. It's, it's, it's over 200 pounds of meat. Taryn, this is a very interesting question, and I'm, I've been wondering the same thing myself. And Taryn is wondering, will they bring the cubs? Now, we are only probably 300 meters from where the cubs are, and they have nine cubs. See, there we go. She, she's just worried the danger the warthog poses. She's going back onto the throat, even though I'm very sure it's it, it, it's very dead. So I'm going to apologize, Seb. I'm just going to put the spotlight where I can hold it more steady. Sure. There we go. How's that? Yeah. So now we're looking at those tusks. So you see the big tusks at the top. It's the bottom tusks that actually 
are the dangerous ones um, because they rub against the top tusks and become incredibly sharp, almost like a razor blade. So there we go. She's now decided that this is very dead. She's going to start feeding. Uh, so now it would have been any of the lionesses if they had been the first on the dangerous part of the lion. Any three of them would have done exactly as she did and, and gone for that throat hold while the others continued to feed from the back. And I know this sounds horrible, but lions have no idea... Uh, about suffering and pain they are instinctive animals that meal is going to provide for their cubs and they don't worry about the warthog's progeny or, or, or the warthog's life this is life for them being able to feed on this animal will ensure that they are able to pass on their genetic line because they're going to be able to produce milk for their cubs and their cubs are very young still under three months old and there are nine of them now you, we might see some aggression between the lionesses shortly because lions forget their manners when they're at dinner tables and they will often beat each other up quite severely and that's why when they're not eating they have incredibly close social interactions with interactions with each other and that's a fir to affirm the pride bonds so far it's been quite civil between these three girls, but that could change in an absolute instant. Once the food gets a little bit smaller, or as I say, there's a little bit less food to go around. Okay, what I'm going to do, Seb, let's go back to me quickly. I'm just going to reposition the car quickly. Now, the lionesses are looking, and that's why I want to just check with the spotlight. Um, and that warthog squeals might have attracted the black rock boys the two dominant males in this area so they keep looking behind me so i just want to use a spotlight to see if those males are coming in and what i'm going to do is also use the headlight on the lions so we don't have as much jerky hand as i have um i hope that works for you sebastian yeah, how is that is that good yes there we go. And this also gives me the ability to check around while you're looking at what the lions are doing to see if any of the males or other lions are potentially coming in. Now, it's very unlikely we're going to get any nomadic males near here because this is the core of the Black Rocks territory. And those Black Rock boys, um, the one-eyed bruiser and the beautiful dark-maned male will protect this area more more so than they will the peripheries of their territory because they have these three females that have nine little cubs that are carrying their genetic information to ensure that their legacy will last for a lot longer now of course those squeals might also attract hyenas Now, again, as I say, to to those of you who are sensitive, um, this is a fresh kill. There will be a lot of blood. Um, so be warned if you are sensitive to these type of things, please go get a cup of tea. But just remember that this warthog, in dying, has provided the mothers of nine little cubs an incredible amount of protein where they will be able to produce milk. Sebastian, sorry, can I ask you to turn off the little light behind me? Oh, sorry, 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 there's a lot of bugs yeah. around tonight. We've had a lot of rain. Um, John is wondering, where are the male lions? So this is the core section of their territory. The male lions will spend a lot of time here, but they will move vast distances from here, patrolling the edges of their territory, making sure no other males can sneak in. Um, because if another male lion comes across the cubs, and there are nine of them, probably... 400 meters from us hidden in the rocks if another male lion came across them he would absolutely kill them and so they make sure the boundaries of their territory are very safe so the females are able to hunt in the, the core of their territory if they are close by being a male lion there's a reason there's a there's a cliche called the lion share uh, if 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 they are close by they will come in and chase the ladies off and take the lion's share but it looks like the boys are out on patrol and uh, far enough away that they did not hear the squealing of this poor pig and they have not rushed in they could still be on their way you never know remember this is a hundred percent live from the middle of the African bush we're in one of the most remote areas you can get in the Maasai Mara with one of the most spectacular prides and definitely one of my favorite prides of lions the black rock pride 
We're about halfway between one of the main camps and the Sand River Gate. So we are only about three or four... No, no I, I exaggerate. So we're about we're about a kilometer and a half from Tanzania. As I say, we're right in a remote corner of the corner of the Maasai Mara. Now, it looks like the ladies are going to continue munching on their. I thought I heard something behind me. Um, they're going to continue to munch on their bacon for dinner, um, and it doesn't look like we're going to get any more interaction from the males or what coming in but you never know what happens as i say we are live from one of the most remote areas in the world the masai mara in kenya and we have just witnessed something that very few people get to see lions digging out a warthog and catching it this has been absolutely incredible my name is brent and my cameraman is my good friend seb and we've been very very privileged to be able to share this with you even though there were some very gory and difficult parts to watch this is nature and this is what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in africa now of course you never know when we might go live again because we're going to be out following lions leopards or cheetahs or even hyenas any fascinating things we come across in the african bush keep an eye out for that go live notification because you might see me again in a short little while Wow, guys, how was that? Wow. Now, I have seen lions dig water, water up quite a few times in my life, but uh, normally I have to wait about two and a half hours when I get there. We just happened to be here at the exact right time uh, to see that. That was incredible. And, of course, now, if I take my spotlight and ask Sebastian to show you, over there... Oh, quickly across to Tristan, I'll tell you the story later. Well, we're still sitting with the Birmingham boys and we're still having a situation where we they are roaring and so we thought we'd extend a little bit longer. Here we go. That is how you end a safari in the evenings. That is the best sound in the world. You can see it's taken it out of Mfuma. He's now decided that that's how he's going to nap. But that was absolutely spectacular. We have been so spoiled. We've been sitting here for a while and we've had, I think this is the third or fourth roar that we've had this evening. It has just been so, so special to sit in. Where we are is actually a really great place to hear roars because it just resonates down this bowl where Chitwa Dam is and it kind of bounces back at you. It is just the most unbelievable experience. We've been so, so, so fortunate to be able to sit here and witness something like that. You can see Mfumo himself. He's looking really good. He's down on the road. And he's kind of just taking it very, very easy. Tinio is still at the back, still not moving. We haven't heard any response from the other Birmingham that's with the sticks down on Cheetah Plains, so I don't know if he's maybe just keeping quiet because he's with a female and he doesn't really want to attract too much attention. But I would imagine maybe it's in Suku down that side. We know in Suku loves to spend a lot of time with the sticks pilot, so I wonder if it's not him in that area there's also been a few guinea fowls alarm calling so we might come back in this area and check around tomorrow maybe hassan is around unfortunately though that is all that we have time for this off this evening it's been an absolutely lion-packed action-packed insane afternoon the masamara has been on fire sabi sands had its own little 
unique little things and to finish off like this is just absolutely unbelievable so from brent jamie taylor all the cam ops outside myself and vm and rebecca in fc it's been an absolute pleasure and we'll see you on the sunrise safari tomorrow